Hansard will be recording uh, some of the oral uh, evidence sessions, just to make people aware of that. Moving on to item one on the agenda, in terms of apologies, we haven't received any apologies, uh, but we do know that I think Emma's just running a little late and will be joining us just shortly. Um, and item two, then, is the draft minutes uh, from the meeting that was held on the 26th of February, or page four of the meeting pack. Are members content that they are a true reflection of the proceedings? Yes. Yep. yep. Okay, so if that's the case, we'll sign the minutes. Okay. Uh, item three for matters arising. One m m matter that I wanted to bring to people's attention, um, which is on page 10 of your pack. Um, after the departmental briefing that we received last week on the Brexit um, matter from the officials, um, the clerk has identified a number of issues that the committee might, might wish to seek further information or clarification on. Now, essentially, that's a list of questions that is there on page 10. And effectively, what we could do is we could write and ask for an update on those information, uh, on those questions. But if we felt that we didn't get a suitable or an appropriate response to those, then that could form the basis of our questions for the next time that we have uh, the officials up to give their presentation in a few weeks' time. So maybe what I could suggest is if members are happy at this stage to note that list of, of questions, uh, to consider that, uh, you know, we, we'll seek the response for them, but we can revisit um, the reply that we get. But would it be a case, is there any other uh, issues or matters that members feel isn't on that list? Or maybe... Could we leave it a day or two to allow members to contact you if they thought? to give the officials time. Well, true, yeah. That's yeah. fine. Are people happy enough with the list that's there? Yes. Okay, so we'll write off and request um, information from uh, the officials on that. And then what we can do now is we can just hold off for a moment whilst the Commission members come in and take their seats. You're very welcome. If you just want thank to, you. yeah, get yourself settled down there. Um, thank you for coming along today to give us the update on uh, your work. Um, I think maybe what we'll do, just conscious as this is the first meeting, we'll maybe go around and just introduce ourselves so that we all uh, can know who each other are. Uh, my name is Colin McGrath. I'm the chair of the committee and an MLA for South Down. And I'll pass to the vice chair. Mike Nesbitt, vice chair, MLA for Strangford. Rob <coughs> McCann, MLA for West Belfast. Matt Sheehan, Sinn Féin, MLA for West Belfast. Never long, uh, independent MLA for Lagan Valley. Yo. <laughs> George. George Robinson, MLA, East Londonderry. Christopher DP. Stolford. Oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. <laughs> George. <laughs> Christopher Stolford, DEP Assembly Member for South Belfast. I'm Trevor Hart, DEP MLA for Southampton. Okay, so that's the members. Maybe if we pass over to yourselves then, just, just to give an, if you want to introduce the team there, and then um, we can progress from there. I think, if I ask, actually, I'm accompanied by two members of the Victims and Survivors Forum, okay. um, Paul Crawford and Leslie Veronica, and Andrew Sloan, who's our Chief Exec at the Commission. Um, Paul, as you know, the members of the Victims and Survivors Forum are established in legislation and are my primary point of consultation with victims and survivors of the Troubles. So whilst all those people <coughs> have lived experience, they also bring a range of skills to the table. Paul is a specialist practitioner in mental health, and Leslie is um, an academic, a lecturer, and an examiner. Okay. Well, you're all very welcome along to the, the committee today. What we'll do is I'll, I'll pass over to yourselves, maybe then to, to give us just a short presentation, um, and then afterwards, then we'll open up for some questions of clarification. Just to let you know um, before we begin, which I never do, but I'm reminding now, is that Hansard are keeping a written record of this, so, uh, and that will be available afterwards as well. So I can pass over to yourself, Judith, then, just to give us a short presentation. Thank you, Chair and Members, and I'm grateful for this early opportunity to come before the Committee today. I will provide you with an update on the work of the Commission, 
and I will discuss the issues of legacy, services and sustainable funding, which are of most concern to victims and survivors. As you know, I'm accompanied by Paul Crawford and Le Leslie Veronica, as members of the Victims and Survivors Forum, um, who bring their advice to me and are very happy to take questions from you today. I'll make some key points in my opening address um, and then obviously we'll welcome questions. Firstly, I would like to talk about why addressing the legacy of the past is so vital to our ability to build a future. The legacy of the past that we live today is 26% of people in Northern Ireland who either affected personally or have a family member affected <coughs> to this day by a conflict-related incident. <coughs> 3,720 conflict-related deaths between 1966 and 2006. 40,000 people injured and 213,000 people experiencing significant a range of mental health issues which need to be addressed now. 22 years have passed since the Belfast Good Friday Agreement and there have been a number of substantial attempts to address the harm that was caused during decades of conflict. However, it's only recently that legislation has been passed with the Victims Payment which begins to address the needs of victims and survivors. And as you'll be aware, the New Decade New Approach included a UK Government commitment to publish and introduce legislation in Parliament to implement the Stormont House Agreement. This is a significant matter and it will be for the governments in Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland to ensure that this is delivered in a way that is to the benefit of victims and survivors across these islands. As members will know, in May 2018, the UK Government published its consultation paper addressing the legacy of Northern Ireland's past, <laughs> which set out draft legislation for implementing a historical investigations unit to tackle more than, a, at a minimum, a thousand deaths which have not been investigated in a way that families have a right to see. An oral history archive to enable people's narratives to be heard and shared an international commission for information retrieval, which will enable a information retrieval process for those for whom other processes will not deliver what they need, and an implementation and reconciliation, reconciliation group, which is there to give statements of acknowledgement and acknowledgement of harm. The consultation drew 18,000 responses from across the United Kingdom, the Republic of Ireland and beyond. And in January 2019, I submitted advice to the UK Government on the proposed legislation. My advice contained 45 recommendations in relation to the proposals to ensure that these measures, if implemented, will meet the needs of victims and survivors. And when I talk to people affected by the Troubles across Northern Ireland, Great Britain and the Republic of Ireland, it is clear that their experiences and their needs are very similar. I believe that these needs should be addressed in an inclusive way and this means that choices and options open to those who live in Northern Ireland should also be open to those who live elsewhere. And that is why, for the first time, I shared my advice with the Government in the Republic of Ireland as well as offering it to the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland. There are clearly different views on the proposed legacy mechanisms. However, it is almost universally accepted that the current system has not been able to address the past and cannot sufficiently address the legacy of the past. It's very clear that in the context of the high levels of disillusionment and low levels of trust which exist across the different political constituencies, then the new approach must be balanced, transparent, must operate within the rule of law and above all must be victim-centred. People who suffered harm have waited too long for effective institutions to be established to address their rights and their needs. In fact, it is more expensive, as well as more costly in terms of harm, to leave things as they are than it would be to try to introduce new institutions that could deliver better outcomes for victims and survivors. Failure to act in relation to legacy will obstruct government's ability to achieve its desired outcomes right across the programme for government. This is a societal issue an issue with impact in every community, and if we do not deal with the past, it will continue to deal with us. 
Once mechanisms are established, additional advocacy and support services will be needed for those engaged in the processes. And my recommendations sought to ensure that any services build on what currently exists and are designed into the way the mechanisms are, 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 are structured. In relation to the victim's payment, at least the same need for support and advocacy applies to this. This is a payment for those people who are most severely psychologically and physically injured. And you don't suffer severe physical injury without being psychologically injured as well. So they are by definition the most vulnerable people. And whatever is implemented must be implemented in a way that delivers support and advocacy and help to people as they go through that process and afterwards, regardless of whether they get money. Considerable time and effort have been invested by many stakeholders in recent years to impress upon government the importance and necessity of acknowledging these people who are severely and permanently injured by their experiences. And I would like to commend the, inspira the inspirational individuals <coughs> of the WAVE injured group who have been so instrumental in bringing this case to a point where it has, we have implementation at Westminster. Whilst the victims' payment regulations in 2020 differ in significant respects from my advice, I still welcome that they will deliver the support that the most severely injured have awaited for far too long. I welcome the altering of the date parameters of the victims' payment scheme. However, as I stressed in my advice and in my response to the NIO consultation, the exclusion of those suffering severe and permanent traumatic injury as a consequence of bereavement who were not at the scene, it's causing hurt. It's some of the hardest phone calls I get. Also, the unantici unanticipated requirement that any person who's been sentenced to more than two and a half years imprisonment for any offence must be reviewed by a judge-led panel is causing anxiety, uncertainty, and it will complement the implementation process, complicate the implementation process. What I would say is that while work continues on the implementation of this scheme, it is important that no further issues, including funding, become an obstacle that delay its implementation. This will be a UK-wide scheme with an indeterminable number of eligible applications and subsequent awards. It seems unfeasible and impractical to require a devolved administration to fund the scheme. Moving on to services, a significant legislative requirement of the Commission is to ensure that support services for victims and survivors are appropriate, fit for purpose and victim centre. And this work is carried out through the advice of the Victims and Survivors Forum, through an active CVS research programme, ongoing engagement with service users and practitioners, and data, which is collected from the Victims and Survivors Service and analysed on a quarterly basis by the Commission. A key concern facing those involved in delivering services over the years has been sustainability, not solely about funding, but also about delivering a needs-based approach. And the introduction of a new service delivery model in 2017, in line with the Commission's advice, has brought with it a number of significant changes to how individuals are supported, which provide greater flexibility to the individual and recognise more complex needs. Um, under Peace for Funding, a, her, a network of health and wellbeing caseworkers has been employed across the region to ensure that individuals have their needs identified and assessed and addressed, sorry, in a holistic and coordinated way. And I would like to take this opportunity to highlight the key role that the Victims and Survivors Service and their health and wellbeing case managers and caseworkers have paid in success, successfully rolling out a needs-based approach across Northern Ireland and into the Republic of Ireland and other parts of the UK. It's particularly welcome for those individuals residing in Great Britain and the Republic of Ireland who nevertheless continue to experience a different level of understanding within their communities of the difficulties they face, as well as a different level of service provision to that the people in Northern Ireland experience. Evidence of the quality of service delivery is monitored by data gathered by the BSS and reviewed, as I said, on a quarterly basis by ourselves. And the implementation of our standards for service delivery, standards which are developed in partnership with 
service users, with those who provide service, and with subject matter, matter experts. Those standards are a requirement now of all VSS funded organisations, and at all levels, the Commission and the VSS meet to monitor and review the quality of services. <coughs> I want to say a few words about the Regional Trauma Network um, and to mention our forum replenishment process before I finish. The Regional Trauma Network is a significant measure within the Stormont House Agreement and the impact of the Commission's advice is referenced in that agreement. This network must be comprehensive, focused and equipped to deal with what is fast becoming a mental health crisis in Northern Ireland. There is a deep but complex and enduring relationship between our mental health crisis and the legacy of the Troubles. The network must also be grounded in the ongoing work of the community and voluntary sector and integrated with the growth in capacity and capability within the statutory sector so that trauma is recognised and responded to wherever it presents. The origin of the Commission's enduring support for the new regional trauma network is located within the Comprehensive Needs Assessment of 2012. This assessment identified an inconsistent and inequitable position, provision of specialist psychological trauma services across the statutory mental health system. I'm aware that there have been a number of concerns and issues that have been raised by the VSS and by organisations relating to the Regional Trauma Network service delivery model. And this, whilst there are significant issues which I am reassured are being are being resolved through dialogue, it has still compounded delays in establishing the new service. This is a service we need now. There are people dying as we speak, by their own hand, and from addictions and complex troubles related trauma. We need to do something about this, and we need to do it quickly. And we need to do it proportionately to the scale of the problem we have. <coughs> Um, as I referenced earlier, substantial funding from Peace 4 has enabled significant growth in services and alongside that has enabled the Commission to run four research projects which measure the impact of those services but also contribute to the new strategy. So the first of these looks at how the impact of the legacy of the Troubles are being addressed in the areas of psychological trauma services and will give direction for those services going forward. The second looks at advocacy, linked to historical investigation and information recovery, and the importance and best models for advocacy. <clears throat> the third looks at continuing and transgenerational impact of Troubles legacy on children and young people and their parents. And that is something to remember when thinking about mental health. People who are not technically Troubles victims will present with Troubles-related traumatic injury and problems because of their parents' experiences, sometimes their grandparents. A review of the needs assessment is to be conducted as well, with a particular focus on the border region and those living outside Northern Ireland. Members will know that the strategy for victims and survivors formally ended in 2019, and in the absence of an executive, ministers are not in place to agree and sign off a new strategy. Therefore, I provide advice to the Executive Office making recommendations in relation to an extension of the funding for the Victims and Survivors Scheme. The main reason for this was that the continued delivery of services and funding was critical, and to allow a gap between the strategies would amount to a gap in funding and the loss of capability that's been built. It also allows us time to consider the findings of the independent review of the strategy, which is ongoing at the moment, and of our own reach perks programmes to feed into a new strategy. My advice also highlighted a number of areas that require attention in the new strategy, such as how best to support the bereaved, how best to support those living outside Northern Ireland, and the need to look at gender-based issues. It also reflected on how strategy partners should continue to build on the constructive engagement across government departments, and I believe that a cross-departmental approach will be key to the new strategy. There will be an extensive programme of engagement by the Commission over the next number of months with individuals, service deliverers, government departments and other stakeholders to inform advice on the new strategy and that advice will be delivered in September 2020. On the forum replenishment, in the next number of weeks I will begin the process of replenishing the Victims and Survivors Forum. 
Similar to my last appointment process, this will be an open and transparent competence-based approach. It will involve a wide-ranging programme of civic engagement and awareness raising to underpin that process and to make sure we reach people and engage with those who will have troubles-related experiences, who will meet that definition of a victim, but may not see themselves as victims and survivors, although they are no less affected by the conflict. I envisage this forum will be replenished by December this year. So in conclusion, Chair and Members, I believe that as a collective community, addressing the issues that are brought to my office by victims and survivors will improve not just their own well-being, but the well-being of all of society. In treating victims' needs as societal needs, we will help Northern Ireland to heal from the wounds of our past, and we will build on a solid foundation towards a future that offers peace, prosperity, and growth for all that live here. Okay, Judith, thank you very much um, for that very <coughs> comprehensive report, and, that, and that's um, very much appreciated given that we are in a new committee that, that has come together. Um, you've made some um, very stark remarks in there that should bring it home just, just the urgency that there needs to be with this, not least the, the line that you said about people who have suffered have waited too long. And I think that that means it's incumbent upon an executive and an assembly and governments to actually start to very quickly um, address um, the outstanding issues and start to see some action uh, rather than, than just merely strategies and, and, and sort of words. We need to actually get the, the action that follows from it. Um, in terms of maybe just a few questions, if I could just maybe kick off with a few questions. Um, you had mentioned that um, um, the the NDNA, which I think we're all calling it so we don't have to remember what the words are, but the NDNA, there is a suggestion that um, within 100 days that there should be um, the published, it should be published mm -hmm. in the legislation. Uh, how confident are you that, that that deadline of 100 days will be met and have you had any interaction from the executive officer government or otherwise um, about the progress of that, uh, given that we're at this stage nearly I'm sure two-thirds are coming up, sorry, on, on halfway through that, that process. Chair, you'll have heard everything I said in my presentation about the importance of these issues. Um, I'm not privy to a recent update on the progress of those proposals. Um, and I'm as conscious as I'm sure everybody else in this room is that those 100 days are passing. So I think it would be fair to say I have concerns well, maybe afterwards we'll discuss some, some actions and maybe we'll certainly be contacting people to sort of find out where that process is, which, which might be useful to, to see where we are uh, and to keep that pressure um, on. Um, you, you give us a series of statistics, which I think yeah. were quite enlightening as well, just to the numbers of people that are impacted within the community and for such a small mm -hmm. place, and I'm sure many members... Um, here will have personal experiences, mm -hmm. and I know certainly my, my own family had, had members that were killed as part of the process. So, um, you know, there's, uh, families will all have that investment in, into the process. But it's maybe just to, to, to get a sense of, you know, sometimes individuals um, lost their lives, but there is a family that is left behind. And there was discussion at a time about bereavement payments, but I think that seems to have been taken off um, the agenda. Can you give me a sense of how important such a, a payment would be? Um, not least in, in that respects, we would hear this very often in different schemes, how it's not the payment, it's the acknowledgement about something that has happened. And that allows closure, which certainly, uh, as many people would be aware, through a bereavement process is important. But can you give us a sense just of how many would be impacted there and, and what impact such a, a bereavement payment could have if it was included? Chair, absolutely. Um, I think you said something very important there. I don't go into any room, and certainly not into this one, without recognising that people who are victims and survivors <clears throat> are around every table and part of our society. So they are civic issues. Um, and... 3,720 deaths means 3,720 families and others bereaved. So it's an experience that runs right through our society. One of the things that's really hard about implementing measures that you can't do everything all at once 
So it is welcome that we have made some progress in addressing the needs of the most severely injured, physically and psychologically. However, there may be limitations to that process. But then that throws into sharp relief the experience of the bereaved. And I said some of the worst, most difficult phone calls I'd had. So I'll give you an example. Um, this lady rings my office, who I, who I ring on a regular basis as well to listen to, um, who was bereaved in the early 1970s, um, who was given as a young parent with two children £6,000 in compensation for her loss, and who listened to a, a sentencer, it was a magistrate who, who dealt with it, that was the system at the time, tell her that as she was a good-looking woman who would surely get another husband, then 6,000 would be sufficient recompense for her loss. Now, that's, that's something that that lady still asks herself, should she not have worn a suit to court that day? And I have said to her more than once, and I know it will make no difference, at that time, the guidelines for awarding compensation were that if a woman was judged likely to remarry, then the amount should be halved. So that is, it's an insult to her loss. It left her dealing with poverty as well as bereavement. And it was certainly not acknowledgement of her loss. So I guess that's one <coughs> hard-hitting example of, of what people are carrying in their experiences of bereavement. Um, and acknowledgement is the key issue. Um, and there are people who did live in poverty and remember that keenly. Equally, however, the issues of dealing with the past, of truth, of access to justice, such as that may be, and I do not lead people to believe that there will be substantial convictions out of any process because I do not believe that is feasible. But there is something about answers. And in every family, people will have different needs and wishes and choices and options are what must be offered. I'd like to offer the forum members the chance to say a word here because they both have yeah. more right than me to speak on this. Thank one. you, Judith. Um, I think it's really important that you've acknowledged, I think, some of the key aspects of successful um, not just a successful peace process, but a success in dealing with victims and survivors' issues uh, by identifying the importance of truth, acknowledgement, reparations, and of course justice. And we would see those as the four pillars that are really important moving forward. Judith's example um, really highlights something that I think informs all of this, and particularly with regards to the bereavement payment, and that's the importance moving forward of a gender sensitive approach. We have not had that. We have talked about it and I know that members of this committee have raised <coughs> issues that are pertinent to that and I acknowledge that. But I think what we've lacked is the, um, the joined up thinking about how do we do it? How do we turn that into action? How do we make something gender sensitive? And people have shied away from it. I've been talking about this for years and have had the eye rolls and all sorts and I know that's not what would happen here. Why do I think that a gender-sensitive analysis might be related to your original question? The majority of people who were bereaved were women. And those women were left. They suffered great socioeconomic harm. Um, they came right across the board. Some were lucky enough to get some sort of state pension. Many did not. Those women were left to bring up families in poverty when they likely could have anticipated that would not happen. We hear the example from Judith of the great sexism that uh, existed at the time and how that impacted on how those women were treated. So I think that... You know, that's, that's another area of work to be looked at, but I think it's very worthwhile. I really genuinely do. And I think that if we look at that sort of approach, we can start to unpick maybe that complex relationship between reparations, which I know um, some international reports have criticised us for not having the reparations bit right. But, but there's lots of bits that we're working on. I mean, I'm very positive about things. I'm very positive on the forum anyway, <laughs> as they'll the all tell you, but I'm very positive about things. I think we're really... The zeitgeist is right now for us to turn a corner and take this on to where it needs to be and that we really need to be getting into a deeper level of constructing peace 
and that these type of things are all relevant. But it is a relevant question. Um, I agree with Judith. I think for us, particularly on the forum, we were more focused on the needs of the severely injured as we watched people getting older. And, and obviously, because you're getting older, you're having more medical problems anyway. If you're then also severely injured, that has a huge impact. You maybe don't have the people around you to help you the way that you would have had when you were younger. And I think that we took the right approach with making that group the priority, which we did for the last uh, number of years to campaign to get the victims payment. But certainly, that's something that we would be thinking about in the future, is having discussions around <coughs> reparations. Do you want to add on to Paul? Or you? Um, well, I would like to say just a couple of things. Mm -hmm. um, I fully agree uh, with both the Commissioner uh, and with Leslie. Um, but there are uh, a number of things. It is disappointing. Um, you mentioned 100 deaths. It's, it's disappointing that there hasn't been clear and transparent communication on where that stands uh, as we reach the halfway point. And I would be concerned given uh, the track history of being over five years since the Stormont House Agreement. Um, and we're still waiting on it, and now we have 100 days, and we're 50 days into that. So that, that is an issue, and I think it is, a, it is an issue which potentially already starts to undermine by creating that, that worry that it might not be done, uh, which could then lead to negativity when what we need is, is a can-do attitude. I also think that there is an opportunity here, um, for want of a better way of putting it, for people to stop working in silos and to have a joined-up approach because uh, the victim survivors' issues, um, the, the, the statistics that Judith quoted, um, are the tip of the iceberg in reality. Um, <clears throat> it goes right across society, it goes right across generations, and when we are in the forum, we're looking at not just the past, we're looking at the past in relation to today and to creating a better future, and to trying to ensure that the conditions where conflict happened in the first place are not recreated. Um, the final thing that I would really like to say is, I, I know Chair, it's strange calling people Chair, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you used the word closure, and um, I think that language is crucially important. And in reality, for people with the lived experience, the horrific uh, and sometimes repeated lived experience, closure does not exist. And we need to start talking in realistic terms, right across the board. And I would suggest, and the forum would suggest, that we start talking about achieving the greatest degree of resolution possible. Because to get closure, you've got to bring back the dead, you've got to put back limbs that are missing, you've got to fix minds that are broken. Uh, you know, so closure, I, I think really right across the board, we need to look at Factual, accurate, realistic, and inclusive language. Okay, th thank you. Um, maybe just to move on, and then I'll conclude with my questions. I think you, you, you more than made the suggestion that a lot of us are um, agreeing to that the payments um, mm -hmm. shouldn't really be uh, coming out of the block grant here um, in Northern Ireland. And, and I know that that's starting to get into very much the nuts and bolts of it. But the, the, the reference that you made that struck with me was that there are many more people other than people just from the north that were impacted by the troubles, and that there are other people that would be potentially drawing down, um, you know, if there are pensions or if there are payments. Has there, are you aware? Has there been any research done or any estimates done as to how many people would be impacted beyond um, the north, and therefore, because that that would obviously build in, I would say, to a case that saying that it shouldn't just fall to the block grant from from here for for those payments, and it's a stronger uh, case of going back to the. Um, the London government and saying that the, that the money should be coming centrally. H has anything been done on that front? Or I'm going to say what I believe the situation is, but I'm, I'm, I'm open to sort of additional information from my researchers. Um, we did some actuarial work yeah. around the costs in Northern Ireland, um, and, and that was the focus of that. And even so, it's difficult, because essentially you're looking at the tip of an iceberg, yeah. and, and your numbers depend on how much of that iceberg 
you end up taking in in your scheme. Um, in relation to outside of Northern Ireland, we have done some work and so have the Victims and Survivors Service on the number of people who are, on the number of incidents that happened outside Northern Ireland, on the number of individuals who are registered as individuals of Victims and Survivors Service, and we could find those numbers. But when you consider that actually everybody who served in Operation Banner, for example, you know, depending on their financial, or depending on whether they already have payments in excess of this amount that are specific to their injury. But if they don't, they're equally potentially eligible. So it is a piece of work that needs to be done. But it's important to remember this is not just a Northern Ireland scheme. Okay, I'll pass over to the Vice Chair to Mike. Chair, yeah, thank, thank you very much indeed. And, and I just begin by stating that, that I was one of the original four commissioners who set up the commission in <coughs> 2008, uh, I believe. You're all very welcome. I particularly want to acknowledge Paul's presence on your multiple losses during the course of the conflict, Paul. And I also agree with you. I, I don't think there's any such thing as closure. I think there is a burden that you're going to carry to the grave. And our challenge is to try and lighten that load for you. Absolutely. Um, <coughs> a few things I want to touch on, beginning with um, the, the Stormont House Agreement, paragraph 27, begins as follows. The Commission for Victims and Survivors uh, recommendation for a comprehensive mental trauma service will be implemented. What did you have in mind, Judith? Okay. I think that the Stormont House Agreement was actually written before my time, Mike, so, but the Commission's advice at that time. Um, it was always envisaged that at a society, and certainly at a service-wide level, we needed a health service that recognised and responded to trauma where it met it. So whilst our advice was absolutely focused on the need for our health service to be troubles informed, trauma aware, and, and to stop a situation where we have massively high levels of prescription, have had for decades, I would imagine Many people go into GP, I would be confident many people go to their GPs with back pain and ongoing dependency on prescribed medication and don't get recognised as victims of trauma and referred to the right services. That needs to be addressed. But did you, do you think the Commission saw it as a service specifically for victims and survivors? I think we always saw it as a service that was focused primarily on troubles related trauma. We didn't see it as being limited to a narrow sector, though, because we'd always advised that it was part of a wider health service and part of upskilling that wider health service to actually recognise trauma that was troubles related and deal with it where it met it. I'm, I'm really not clear. Was it for victims and survivors or was it a more general national health service service? I know that this is what you're making. Yes, of course, we were talking about victims and survivors, but we saw that as being not just those people identified as victims and survivors, but those who will be in contact with every part of our health system and not necessarily identifying as such. Are you aware the Department of Health is taking legal advice on whether... I am, yes. Are you aware of what the... I'm not asking you to tell me what the no, advice no. is. Are you aware of what the advice is? Um, I believe so, yes. OK. Uh, Victims' payments, uh, as you say, are coming out of London. You gave advice. Not all of it was, was uh, brought forward. Um, it's for the most severely injured. Is it right to say that the criteria which will define the most severely injured have not yet been published? Um, in the uh, regulations, I believe there's reference to the scales and um, existing mechanisms that would define those injuries. So we recommended that it be based on examples from the industrial injuries compensation scheme and the armed forces compensation scheme, where you have scales which describe levels of both physical and psychological injury um, and enable the levels of payment to be tied to them. And I believe I, you're asking me, and it's, it's a very big piece of regulations, but I believe those things are actually referenced in the regulations as a model for right. determining severity. Your answer is not answering my question. Are the criteria set? I believe that existing, I believe that there is a model, tried and tested, which is referenced in those regulations. Okay. 
Yes. To, to put it another way, then, Judith, colleagues of mine have been liaising with the Northern Ireland Office who say mm -hmm. the criteria are not set. And on that basis, it would not be possible to um, advise with any surety any victim whether or not they would qualify. Okay, well, I can't answer with their Northern Ireland office. My understanding of that would be there is a model there. We aren't starting with a blank sheet of paper. Knowing when any individual will be placed in this place or that place on the model, you won't know until they've been through the process. If we, if we look at funding, in my time, the funding of victims and survivors groups was, was a large issue for two reasons. It was annual, which meant there was very little continuity and, and security of funding. And it was also competitive. So the groups who should have been sharing best practice did not share best practice for fear that they would lose out in the next funding round. Have you taken a view and have things moved on? Um, we've certainly delivered significant advice around the funding for victims and survivors group. I think there's been a real shift. Um, those groups who deliver services to victims and survivors and are, and are funded by the BSS are service providers. That is a shift. They're a range of organisations that grew up from the experience of individuals and communities, but they are now service providers. They work to standards, they are involved in training and development, they work collaboratively through victims practitioners working groups, and they, they research and seek feedback from their service users on the impact of what they do. So there is a growth in the, there is a direction of travel where, where we have a growth in capability and capacity. And I think, and this is something you'll hear far more from, from the Victim Survivor Service, because they're hands-on delivering that programme. Um, but I believe there is a direction of travel towards those groups being much more able to collaborate, much more able than they previously were to, to share and, and work with each other around service provision. And that is, that is not, a, it's not a destination. It's a continuing journey, as any service delivery should be. As you said, the 10-year strategy ran out in 2019. I believe consultation has begun on, on a new one. Any significant changes you would be proposing? It's, I will deliver my advice formally in September. Um, there are a number of themes I think we need to address. Um, I think that the issue of people who live outside Northern Ireland <coughs> is a theme that needs to be addressed. I believe, and I said this in my presentation, that locating this strategy with just one government department actually you know, mitigates against, in some ways, what needs to be achieved, which is a real cross-programme for government impact. This is a societal impact uh, an issue. It impacts severely on health and justice and the executive office and Department for Communities, but actually it impacts everywhere. Um, so it will be much better seeing a cross-departmental strategy. As Commissioner, I advocated and will continue to advocate that there should be something deliverable in our outcomes for the programme for government that clearly pulls together the different aspects of dealing with the past and victims and survivors issues. The last strategy seemed to suggest that over the course of 10 years, we should move towards mainstreaming the delivery of services, <coughs> um, rather than having bespoke victims and survivors services. Uh, do you think the sector is ready for that? I certainly don't think we're ready to dismantle any of what we have, but I think the way forward isn't to do that. I think if you take the proposals for the Regional Trauma Network as a model, what you would be looking there for at would be community-based delivery by a range of organisations with their roots in the community and integration at the more acute levels with a health-led provision, um, but really good integration. And this is an integrated service delivery model, bringing together statutory and voluntary partners to give the capacity and the community engagement that you need to address the issues. And for me, it's building that model. But I mean, the advice is still to come. Again, I actually want to see if my forum members want to add any thoughts Can on I that. Say, um, I think that that comes to what I was saying about previously working in silos and, and getting away from that. Mm. 
The Regional Trauma Network needs to be just that, not a service. It needs to be a network. And the organisations which are already there, which are within the community, uh, which are within the community and voluntary sector, have decades of experience. They quite often have their own life experience as well. They know their own part of the community. And it is essential that the, the mainstream um, statutory bodies work uh, more closely uh, and more in partnership with the community and voluntary sector and that the greatest amount as is reasonably possible of the regional trauma network be delivered within the communities where uh, the impact mm. is most felt. Um, and there are um, probably about five of those uh, across the north, which are uh, really the urban villages uh, areas. So, um, upskilling in regard, uh, upskilling the, the people who are already in the victim sector, but also upskilling the rest of the main, the main statutory bodies, mm. anybody delivering services, in essence, um, to be trauma aware and to uh, particularly GPs to be able to make the appropriate direct mm -hmm. referrals, mm -hmm. uh, which, which probably would be much more cost effective and cut out, you know, possibly four, four or five steps. Um, so in short, it needs to be a coordinated, it needs to be community based and as far as absolutely possible. And I would say, should, and as far as possible, include upskilling people with life experience to, to actually work um, in, in that area with other people. A big factor in delivering that poll is going to be how, how services are procured. And I know there's concern over Protect Life too, the suicide prevention mm -hmm. strategy, that procurement could knock out <coughs> smaller voluntary community sector groups who've been working with communities, not for years, but for decades. Could I pick up on that and say I believe it's really important that that doesn't happen mm -hmm. and that at whatever stage that procurement process is at, we need to engage with it now mm -hmm. to make sure that doesn't happen. It's, it's very, mm -hmm. it's not advanced. Yeah. The point has been made. Sorry, can no. I just add one, mm -hmm. one other point, please? I'm sorry for coming back. We hear an awful lot about PTSD or complex PTSD. And the reality is that there is quite a few people diagnosed with that, but it goes much wider than that. And in actual fact, within the communities, uh, and one of, the, one of the, the big reasons why uh, it needs to be community-based and as far as possible, social isolation. There's people in the area that I come from, I've, li I've lived in West Belfast all my life, uh, and I know people of my age in their 60s who have not gone past the city centre in 30 years, who are very hard, actually, and afraid to come out of their own homes and require that support. So it's not just your, your high end, your PTSD. It's from social isolation to anxieties to mm -hmm. depression, et cetera, et cetera. And, and that is a lot of people. And that's the people that you need you need to provide a service to and and to me the join up approach getting out of the silos partnership working and gps making the proper referrals in a timely manner okay and um, pat can i <coughs> just find on, on the back of something mike said that was it's interesting i know that in terms of uh, the whole issue of suicide one of the difficulties you've had is uh, getting GPs to work and recognise the difficulties that, that's there. How can you expand that to ensure that people who go to the GP are getting the type of treatment and are being pointed and signposted in the right direction? Well, the mental health services in general, and I need to be very clear that I'm here as a member of the forum and not speaking in any way for the mental health organisation I work for. Generally speaking, the services leave a lot to be desired. They, they could do with more funding, they could do with more staff, the same right, right across the health sector, but mental health in particular. Um, GPs, um, in fairness to them, um, 
if someone is at that space where they are going to take their life, unless it's during the GP's office hours and they're able to get an emergency appointment, the, the GP is really powerless. The, G, the GP could follow up later on if he gets a report. At the minute, um, community-based organisations uh, do a great job uh, in as far as they can. And people present to accident and emergency and, and other places, which is really not good enough, uh, just to be blunt about it. So again, coming back to the regional trauma network, not all, not all the suicides are as a result of post-conflict issues, but quite a lot of them are. Not all of the excessive uh, prescription medication and other addictions such as alcohol are uh, as a direct result of um, the conflict, but quite a lot of them are. And you can take that across, you know, the, the, whole, the, the, the whole spectrum. So it needs a joined up approach. It needs a new strategy for suicide prevention mm -hmm. to be implemented. It needs for all of the services mm -hmm. to be properly funded. Mm -hmm. It needs for all of the uh, staff and volunteers providing services uh, to be properly skilled, mm -hmm. to be properly paid, to know uh, their limitations, which service is appropriate for which. And that's, that's quite a bit of work. Um, and that's not, that's not in any way to criticise people who are doing a fantastic job at present and who are working very hard, but they're very limited and very restricted in what they can do because of lack of both financial and human resources. Okay, so, so, just one wee uh, small point. Fry, you're going to get me in trouble, but I'll allow it for you since <laughs> your last meeting, and then I'll because comment on the end. I know if you, uh, Ali was going to GP uh, service and maybe a week, two weeks before mm -hmm. you get an appointment. Uh, they're packed, they're under pressure, and uh, whilst GPs provide an excellent service, you know, there, there are other aspects of uh, mm -hmm. mental health facilities and services, and some of it lies within the, the, the community health yes. Uh, hubs that exist within areas. Can you see the Emmons playing a role in the I, I think that, straight that is? I think you're spot on. And in the Collin neighbourhood on the edge of West Belfast, um, they recently had uh, a weekend where there was uh, an emergency clinic, if you like, available 24 7 over, over the peak danger time of the weekend. There's a lot of very proactive work going on, um, and, and there's other initiatives. Um, for young people, for example, midnight soccer and stuff up in uh, Sully Gardens. To me, people should look at the Collin neighbourhood in West Belfast, which I'm saying because I'm familiar with it, but all of the organisations, all the community-based organisations work together. And, and I must say, the uh, political, political elected reps in the area are fantastic. Uh, they're always available. So, Yes, I think they have a key role, and I, I, I come back to this thing of getting out of the silos. You know, people who can make the biggest difference to your mental well-being are the people who know you, not necessarily professionals. They can uh, listen to you, they can support you, they can help you through your journey and maybe get you to the point where you go to a professional, but you are most likely to get your initial and most important help or support from family, friends, or neighbourhood. Thank you, Chair. Pat. Thanks, Chair, and thanks very much to all of you for coming in today. Uh, I, I just wanted to ask some questions uh, around the regulations, the legislation for the, the Victims' Payment Scheme. I'm wondering, did you have any discussions or contact with the British government when they were developing these regulations? Um, I'm going to prefix everything by saying that I'm not a lawyer and I'm not going to tread into language, places that I think the lawyers will resolve. Um, yes, I gave advice, as you know, um, to the Secretary of State recommending there should be a victim's payment, which we called a pension at that stage. Um, and 
subsequent to the consultation, I put in a response. Um, but the actual shape of the regulations as they now appear wasn't known to me, um, other than I had a conversation with the Secretary of State in the late afternoon, the day before they were laid. <clears throat> Even at that stage, the detail of what was in them. Not only was I not privy to it all, but I was told and I believe that it was still being finalised. And so the regulations, I'm sure you would agree with me that they are inconsistent and incompatible with the 2006 order and the definition of them. The way in which the payment scheme operates is clearly different to the definition I work under. That doesn't change my role. It does not change the law under which I work. It does not change the law under which the Victims and Survivors Service will work. But you, as and your organisation, as the primary source of advice to government, your advice was ignored by the government, effectively. Because My your, your advice was not followed in a number of respects. <coughs> That's correct. I mean, your, your job is to advocate on behalf of victims on the basis of the 2006 order. I mean, your, your, your own organisation is based uh, in terms of statute in the 2006 order, wouldn't that be right? My job is to support and advocate for all victims and survivors as defined by that legislation. That is absolutely correct. In relation to that advice, I delivered my advice. Now, I have consistently said, whoever has been asking me the questions, that it was never acceptable to do nothing for anyone because we couldn't do something that was going to meet with everybody's wishes or with the political narratives which thread through this. So you are correct. I operate under that order. It determines the role of my organisation and the way that funding is delivered. But the fact that a political decision was made which enabled this to move forward, and can I say as well, it moved forward through regulations. By the time that was laid, there's no amendment, there's no debate. It falls or it stands. So I was left in a place where either nobody got anything, as it has been, and I have always said that was unacceptable, or something goes ahead which is what it is, and it's not what I advised. However, it is what it is. We need to make it work the best way we can going forward. Yeah, and I suppose I'm just trying to get some clarity around the advice that you gave to the government. Okay, I mean, It's published. There's nothing, yeah. nothing secret about yeah. my advice. It's all been in the public domain yeah. for quite and, a long and, time. And that advice would be compatible with the 2006 Yes, in fact, <laughs> when I gave my advice, it was acknowledged by ourselves, by the Executive Office and by the Northern Ireland Office that I can only advise under the legislation which governs what I do. Therefore, I did not offer any advice beyond that legislation, okay, because I couldn't. But the decisions that were subsequently politically made um, enabled the scheme to move forward. I'm not saying that they were in accordance with my advice, they were not. And, and, and since the publication of the regulations, have you commissioned any advice in relation to the incompatibility with the 2006 order? I think my clear understanding as it sits is that nothing changes about my role, about the legislation I operate under, or about the way that funding through the Victims and Survivors mm. Service will be. Um, the fact that the new piece of legislation has a different and, I have to say, very unclear implication for who will get this payment um, doesn't change my legislation and my way of working. And I, I'll come on to that in a second. Uh, but the reason I asked you that question was because in, in the statutory duties of the Commissioner, <coughs> it states that the, the Commissioner shall keep under review the adequacy and effectiveness of law and practice affecting the interests of victims and survivors. And that's why I'm asking you if you have commission advice in relation to that. Not at this point in time, I haven't. I think there is an awful lot yet to be clear about it. At the moment, we have a process where we know that everybody bereaved 
and not at the scene and traumatised by that is excluded. Um, and I think we need to do other things to address their needs. And we I know that anybody sentenced to more than two and a half months is linked to the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act, and you'll know that legislation has a number of clauses. But bro broadly, if you're sentenced to more than two and a half years, then, then an offence is never spent, and they've tied it to that. Um, that's wide open. So, no uh, idea how yeah, those decisions are made. And so in relation to the 2006 order, there are a number of categories of victims who are excluded from this payment. Yeah. And uh, there's also a lack of clarity in the guidelines. So there's also a suggestion that other victims may be excluded on the grounds of exceptional circumstances, and there's no definition of that, or on the basis of material evidence and we don't have a definition of that. Are you, have you any idea what those uh, concepts are? I have no more idea than the next person of that. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is wide open. Um, there is the potential, but not the certainty, within the legislation for some direction to come from the Secretary of State. I think there is the likelihood that this is the mechanism which will end up being determined in the courts. You, you expect a legal challenge to it? I would be very surprised, speaking personally, if there wasn't one. I think any piece of legislation that's wide open ends up being reviewed. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, have you had sight of the guidelines yet? I, I don't even know whether the Secretary of State will issue guidelines. Um, I know the legislation says he or she may. Um, I know that um, I think it is expected or anticipated, but no, I haven't seen any. And has the Secretary of State consulted you at all in regard to development of guidelines? No. Thanks for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Trevor Clark. Thanks, Chair. <clears throat> Paul, in response to Mike, something just struck me. Uh, I mean, I thank, thank you for your, for your presentation. But you used the word closure. And I think even given that there will be a, a differing opinions in terms of what victims are, um, obviously, Pat's uh, definition and mine will be entirely different, but closure strikes me, and I think it's a, it's a very important word. It's probably the most important thing I've heard today. Can you describe, in your words, what you think closure would look like? I don't think closure exists. Um, as I said to the chair, because it, it, it was the chair that used the word. I think that what we should be striving for is the greatest degree of resolution which is possible to attain. I, I really don't think closure exists. Uh, the three members of my family who lost their lives, well, you know, they're never going to be alive again. Uh, likewise, right across the, the, the injured, uh, people who, for example, went right through the conflict. So um, what I do know about is West Belfast. West Belfast, 623 dead, over 9,200 physically injured probably 18,000 um, psychologically injured, and many, many more, uh, another number of thousand went to jail because of their life experience uh, and choices that they made in that, in that uh, conflict zone. Um, I was raised in that conflict zone. I still live in it. I call it a conflict zone very deliberately. Within... Uh, probably four miles long, two miles wide, 42 security bases. That, that is the uh, area that you're working in. Population at that time, 60,000. You are probably uh, <coughs> pinning it down to a fifth to a quarter of the population of West Belfast directly impacted. And I mean directly. Dead, injured, in jail, getting arrested. I myself have never knowingly broken the law. I was arrested many times. I was beaten many times. I was tortured. I was a teenager in West Belfast. These are things that I say not to um, throw anything out there or everything's our fault or everything's our fault. I throw it out there to say these issues are, are alive, every one of those issues, and right across the spectrum. And if you were to, uh, you were saying yourself and, and uh, Pat, um, 
your, your, your idea of a victim will be different, but you will have your own um, list of uh, your side of it. You will have your own life experience. Those, those are the things, and I think it's a crucial point, those, those are the things and those life experiences, they need to be addressed to the greatest degree possible. And the way to do that is to fully implement the Stormont House Agreement because to, to do it any other way is to prejudge, and, and, and since you've raised it, whether Pat's right or whether you're right, um, that's, that's not the way it should be. People have suffered, people, not unionists, loyalists, republicans or loyalists or, or others, people, human beings, Human beings suffered and human beings uh, took action according to where they found themselves in their own life experience. In my father's case, my father's life was taken by the UVF. I have no animosity towards any of the UVF volunteers. I know they don't say terrorists. UVF volunteers who took my father's life. I can't in any shape or form say anything was right about it whatsoever. But I can acknowledge that I have no animosity and that the people who did that have a very different life experience than me to that point. The Stormont House Agreement structures are best placed, they're agreed by the two governments, they're agreed by the main parties here as the best way to move forward. Then without, um, I'm sorry I'm going on a bit but I will stop, um, without getting in and reigniting the conflict um, going through the properly established structures with the proper support to get the answers to your, to your question from whoever the other side or sides might be. And it's complex, it's difficult, it's financially expensive. However, I would argue in the long run, financially, emotionally and uh, societally, if there is such a word, much more cost effective. So, so I mean, I, I wasn't challenging you because no. you're perceived to be from a different perspective. Oh, no, I no, so I didn't think you were. Don't take that away. I, so, I, I, mean, I my, hope I didn't come across that no, 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 way. No, 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 no. I think that's important. I, I wanted to disqualify that in case... You have I, to try harder than that, then. <laughs> because, because I'm going to come back at you, obviously. <laughs> um, my father worked for the security forces. My brother worked for the security forces. Yes. We grew up checking under our cars. We Absolutely. grew up with that. that. That was the way we grew up. So, I may not have lived in West Belfast. I may, may have lived in Sleepy Rambles Town. My brother served for the British Army. He couldn't come and visit his mother. Absolutely. That was the experience we had. My brother-in-law was murdered in T-Ban for doing a day's work, for coming home as a workman in the van and killed with seven of his colleagues. So these people made choices because they, they chose careers. My father and my brother, in my words, legitimate forces, British Crown, they worked for them both. My brother was a civilian worker working in an army base and he was killed because he worked for the British forces. So there was victims right across, and I, I accept that. I mean, I've just read both your stories Absolutely. on the internet. I mean, Absolutely. both very harrowing and, and sense. So I, I'm not going to, I mean, I may use different words than you. I mean, I don't care which label we give the individuals who mm -hmm. perpetrated murder. In my eyes, they were all terrorists. So from both sides, they were terrorists. So you might not want to call them that, but that's what I call them all, because they took your father's life and it was Terrace who took Leslie's father's life, and it was Terrace that took my brother-in-law's life. So, in my book, they're Terrace, and I think we have to call them that. And I think, now, you say about the Stormont House Agreement, mm. it may have got broad political support. However, I do not believe that it got broad political support within our communities, each of the communities we come from. Because where you get to a position that you equate someone who went out to take another man or woman's life as someone the same as the person that they tried to murder as an equal, I don't think that will ever wash. But one of your, your, your words struck me in response to the chair, and that's why, that's why I wanted to, come up to, to actually ask you what this looked like, what this, this resolution, and, and, and I accept what you're saying, closure won't fix it, because closure, closure doesn't bring any of those thousands of people back. The other thing struck me, and I'll, I'll just roll this into two questions, the other thing struck me actually was about the stats for West Belfast. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not picking on West Belfast, <laughs> just when I looked at the stats, and this nearly turned this into a health debate. Because I'm not sure that the model works. You refer to the GP during the day. I have a family member who's PTSD. Mm -hmm. Went to the GP during the day. 
was referred to the crisis team, difficulty getting to see the crisis team. The crisis team made the phone call and didn't want to see the patient. So here you have a GP saying, needs to see the crisis team. Here you have the crisis team saying, no, you're okay, because they told the crisis team on the phone they weren't suicidal. To me, that doesn't work. The system's broken. Now, that's not conflict-related, mm -hmm. but it's important that, that that individual still has PTSD, and I think that goes back to Mike's, in terms of the whole mental health stuff. Mm -hmm. why, why, why are we separating these? I mean, for me, I think we need the expertise in the one place, and everybody should feed in that, because whilst there has been a difference between victims in terms of those conflict-related tr troubles, there are still an awful lot of people who are dying day and daily because of mental health issues not directly connected to the troubles. But if I look at the stats to West Belfast, per head of population, I'm not trying to criticise you, I, I, I get concerned that some people hang their hats on the public sector, sorry, the, the private sector or the community sector delivering massive gains. I stand to be convinced, and actually the stats reassure me that I, my thought pattern may be right, because per head of population in Belfast, there is still more people dying from mental health than there is outside of Belfast. So the reason I'm making that point to you, Paul, is I don't actually believe that the community sector can deliver this. I think there's much more expertise needed to crack whatever this is and wherever it's went wrong. So that's probably a statement more than anything else. Well, listen, I think, I, just, uh, I think I should answer. <laughs> Sorry. First of all, I don't see any conflict uh, between us whatsoever. Uh, what, what you have said actually reinforces uh, some of the things that I've said. Um, there are different narratives, there are different life experience, and what you did there was you've, you've said clearly what your side of it is mm -hmm. uh, and, and where your stance is, and I think that just illustrates the complexities of it. I, I don't see any conflict in, in between positions. But there's not conflict, Paul, because you and I want the same thing. We want to be Absolutely. in a place where we all live as equals. But if, every, everybody wants the same thing, and in terms, in terms of uh, conflict resolution, uh, different sides just want the same things off different people, mm -hmm. generally. Um, in regard to uh, West Belfast um, and the community thing, that, that is tied with what I'm saying about not working in silos. Now, I'm not saying it should be purely community and voluntary sector. What I'm saying is they have an important role to play, yeah. as does indeed the, mm -hmm. the statutory sector. What I'm saying is it needs to be joined up, it needs to be partnership, and quite a lot of it needs to be community-based. Um, and in regard, uh, in regard to um, treating people the same, I'm not talking about a moral equivalence. I'm not talking about. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm not talking about um, anybody being right or wrong. I'm talking about human beings who have suffered. And uh, for me personally, I cannot picture myself being in a position to refuse to help a human being who has who has been harmed uh, in whatever way. Um, and I think, actually, and again, it's a personal thing, I don't think we can really move forward um, if we're going to constantly try, before structures are set up, to decide who's right and who's wrong. We're just fighting the conflict in a different way. So the, so the structures need to be set up. The, it, to me, um, while it's not perfect, uh, in fact, far from it, but the Stormont House Agreement is there. It is generally agreed. There will always be dissenting voices to, to whatever. Um, but people are dying by the day, both victim makers and victims uh, and others. And we are losing opportunities for justice, for truth recovery, and, and for resolution on a daily basis. And, and that's where I was coming from. And, in, in making that, I, I think that whatever your story is and whatever uh, Pat's story is, uh, they're both equally followed, but they, they need to be put forward through the structures uh, and then see, see where it goes. Because on your side of the equation, there is, there is a number of questions, I'm sure, uh, that need resolved. And likewise, on your side of the equation, and then there are many other sides to the equation as well. 
um, there's, um, there's the non-state actors right across the board, and there's the state actors across the board, and there's the people who are in between, uh, who may or may not have been state actors, uh, you know, um, the whole collusion and agent thing. You can argue with that all day. That needs to go through the, the proper structures. But for me, and I just finished this one, Chairman, there's two, two points I want to make quickly. One, first of all, Paul, in terms of your experience with the police, I couldn't condone that either in terms of their actions. In terms of, if you, and, I'm, and I take you, I've only met you for first, yeah. uh, and you've never, you, in, your, in your words, you've never been in trouble. So I could not condone the actions of the police for that. That's wrong. Um, but, and I mean, you and I will be on the same page in the sense that we want to get a resolution. Mm -hmm. But that resolution needs to be a resolution that doesn't take some people back. Absolutely. And, I, and, and you may notice that I didn't criticise or condemn anybody. I merely stated, this is a fact, this was my life experience. Yeah, yeah. Your life experience is different. Oh. <clears throat> Can I come in there as well? Because I think your original point was, you know, what does resolution look like? Yes. Which is a really powerful Forgot point. Lost there, didn't yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it is a really powerful point. And I think um, you know, for me, it is about that. One of the things we found in this forum, we work really well together in the forum. You know, we don't come in, we don't represent, I think because we're unique in the sense that we're individuals, we're not people that work in the field, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. All right, it's unusual to have a, a forum like that. And then, um, although some people on the forum are members of victims groups, many aren't. Um, many have never really strongly identified as a victim, myself mm -hmm. included, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. but, like, it was a friend of mine, I tell the story all the time, a Danish academic who said to me, the forum's being replenished, why don't you apply? I was like, what forum are you talking about? And I mean, I pride myself on knowing Northern Ireland politics, they knew nothing about it. So that's our background and we work very well. And part of the reason why we work very well is because we do exactly what, what Paul was talking about. We deal with everybody as human beings first and foremost. You know, we come from a human perspective. Mm -hmm. And I think that the way that we get to some sort of resolution is by doing that, is by interacting with each other and with how we deal with the conflict as human beings first and foremost, by reintroducing a healthy dose of compassion and how we deal with things. Um, in terms of how we, we use our language appropriately, we move to a place where we can, and I think we've already started doing that. We've made great strides doing that, you know. I think having our institutions up and running is so important for that, much more important than very many people will recognise outside of this room mm -hmm. and outside of this environment, but I think it's vitally important um, because these institutions show that we can work together and that we deliver something that's really important for local people. Now, I would believe that everybody in this room believes that we're better off with these institutions. Um, I know that anybody that works closely um, in any sort of policy advisory role, certainly within uh, where I am in FE, we know how important it is to have these institutions up and running and that we can see deliverable results. So I think that uh, in terms of what does it look like, it, it looks like us moving together with a more compassionate language, a more forward-looking language, and certainly something that while we can acknowledge the hurts of the past, we can also acknowledge that there is a better future there. Um, it also requires us to be more creative. Um, in terms of what I'm interested in, I suppose I'm more of a, I hate the term blue sky thinker, but I'm more of a blue sky thinker. So for me, I had a discussion earlier about trauma and about who was the regional trauma network for, for example. I mean, I really think we need to, to widen our definition of trauma. We need to think about what are the, the big thing for me is hidden trauma. Right, it's the person who manifests trauma. I am a teacher, I've been a teacher for 30 years. When kids act out, kids very rarely act out in a nice straightforward way that tells you, oh, it's because of this thing that happened here. Uh, if a child is traumatized, it exhibits trauma nine times out of 10 by being really badly behaved in a way that makes you very unsympathetic or even prepared to sit down and say to them, look, but you know what, what's gonna help you? So whenever I'm looking at young people coming through um, as I say, 30 years I have been teaching and in the last five years in particular, and it's getting worse year on year, the number of young people presenting with severe mental health problems, and these are real, like, you mm -hmm. know, this whole snowflake thing really gets on my nerves. I see these kids, these are real problems. Um, and this year alone, the number of students, some of which have had to be driven to their own GP, 
for immediate intervention, Fra? Suicide ideation or talking about suicide, or actual suicide attempts. And it's getting worse. <clears throat> now, I, because of my interest and because I work with young people, I do a lot of reading around all this. And certainly some of the ideas about the impact on the developing fetus. Um, if the mother is in a conflict zone or in a bad situation, mm -hmm. it could even be domestic violence, it could be anything, in terms of predisposing the developing brain to addiction, to all sorts of problems. So all of that stuff's out there. I'm not saying that's one, you know, that's a theory. It, it seems like a well-supported theory, mm -hmm. but it is a theory. Mm -hmm. um, but as I say, for me, I'm very broad on all of this. And I think that broad approach, in a way, starts to pushes in a more forward-looking direction, which is where I really think we need to go. And again, I suppose it's because of the nature of my job. Like, I'm really interested in, in building this for young people. Okay, Mike, you wanted just to comment? I, I just have to put on record that not all the local parties support the legacy proposals in the Stormont House Agreement. Paul, you seem to give the impression that we all do. The LC unions don't, so okay. thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, we have two more speakers, and we're 30 minutes over at least. So if uh, it's on for every member's questions are as important, but if we could keep the question and answers as, as short as what well, we're now three more speakers. So um, if I could pass on now to Trevor Lum. Uh, yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, I'll keep it short. Um, I'm so glad you're here today because we, it's, we've been through a three year hiatus where nothing seems to have happened in this, mm -hmm. this area. And that's, that's appreciated by a period when people were involved to a certain extent in trying to bring some sort of order and resolution to it. Um, it we really need to hear from people like you, Paul, and yourself, Leslie. Um, I think you're very brave to come here and speak the way you have. Uh, I'll, I'll lighten the mood slightly because um, you mentioned the midnight soccer at the Sally yes. Gardens. Well, I'm pretty sure that was set up when the Sally Gardens was being funded by Lisburn Council. I was on. I think, I think, it, I think it was yeah. actually, and it's still going. Yeah, it's still going. That, that's brilliant, and I hope it's, it's beneficial great, to the people who use it. <coughs> this, this question of the definition of a victim, we, we keep coming back to this, and I'm not sure how many years now we've been, been uh, discussing or arguing about this. And there are some of us who decided some years ago that it was, it was probably worthwhile for, in terms of the, the greater degree of resolution, I think that is what you meant, that uh, it, it might be possible to bite the bullet, for the sake of, that's a, not an unfortunate phrase, but you know what I mean, and uh, it, then to accept that for the greater good, it might be better to offer some sort of recompense, however unsafe it felt at the time, to people who were the victims of their own, of their own hand. Um, I can remember stating this publicly and getting slaughtered for it. You know, I just I know it was anathema to some people and still is. But where where would we be now if we had gone that route? And the idea was was just to siphon off the people who were in that category and let them be dealt with separately. And there was even a piece of legislation produced by Professor Luke. Uh, it was indeed. Yeah, who provided a the bones of a solution to this. And I, I thought it was a good a good outcome, a possible outcome. But we are where we are, and now we have, we're waiting for these regulations. So I'll get to the question now. The, the, you, you say you're still operating under the 20, 2006 Absolutely. order. Absolutely. Of course you are. Um, these regulations presumably will have the force of law when they come in. They, yeah. I, I, I don't see that it changes either my legislation or the way the office operates. Mm -hmm. We have a victim's payment scheme which operates to parameters which do not include everyone who continues to meet the definition of victim. It does not change the fact that those people meet the definition of victim, but it does mean they will not meet the parameters of this award. In fairness, you know, this reward was always for people who were severely and permanently injured. So those who'd got better were always going to be excluded. Those people who didn't meet the level of severity were always going to be excluded. Um, so I don't see that the fact that people who remain defined as victims under the law that I operate under will nevertheless not necessarily qualify for this payment. That doesn't change the law I operate under. Okay. And the... Just for clarity for myself, this, this two and a half year stipulation that's going to be in the new regulations, 
that's, that's the length of the sentence, not the length of time served. That's correct. Right. Well, I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm treading into dangerous lawyerly territory here, <laughs> but they have tied the requirement for a person to be considered by a panel to a piece of legislation which has existed for a long time called the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act. And that act, as I understand it, and I work with it as a probation officer, basically said, if you've committed an offence which is below a certain bar, then after a while, you don't have to declare it to employers. It was to help people get jobs. Yeah. Yeah. But certain things you always have to declare. Um, and that bar is actually quite complicated. There's a lot more to it than just the two and a half years. But it does say that any, any offence for which you are sentenced, and you're right, not served, sentenced yeah. to more than two and a half years, uh, can never be spent. And I think that is where they kind of tied the bar with this. And, and that, that actually is not miles away from what was being proposed a number of years ago mm. in the professor's led, proposed legislation. Because if I remember right, that the idea of that, <coughs> the people in that category would be separated mm -hmm. and, and passed straight to an mm -hmm. appeal panel. Mm -hmm. I think I'm right. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't and it remains enough. very, very unclear what will happen when they get to yeah, that panel. But I have a feeling that, to conclude, Chairman, I have a feeling that what's, what's going to be the final outcome of this will not be a mile away from what. <coughs> it just seems a grand shame that this process has been extended for what, five or six years because of it. <coughs> well, look, I, I really, people have waited too long for this. Well, I, I wish you well, folks, and I hope we can get, bring this to the conclusion quickly. Outrageous. Thank you very much. Okay, um, Christopher and then George. Thanks very much. Thank you for coming and um, speaking to us. I have two specific questions, but <coughs> I just want to sort of address some of what has been said. I accept that there is no single interpretation of history. I'm a history graduate, studied history, um, but I also believe that there is such a thing as objective truth. Mm -hmm. There isn't your truth and my truth. There is actually a truth that exists independently of events. And I think the, the phrase that you used in terms of choices that they made in reference to people who ended up in jail, they did end up in jail because of the choices that they made. There are other people who didn't have a choice in terms of the suffering that was inflicted upon them. Uh, I was born in 1983, and although I don't look at politics, it's a rough trade. Um, I was born in, in 1983, Colin McGrath, um, and um, for me, I didn't really experience the worst of the troubles. It was the tail end of it. We lived in Cloyne Place, which was at an interface, so there was obviously some tension there. One of the abiding memories that I have, there was two boys in my class at Nettlefield Primary School, uh, my best friend, uh, Scott Patterson. Whenever the cloud would get, the sky would get dark, this is when we were wee, wee children, he would run into the, primary, in, into the school. And I didn't understand why this was happening. It was happening because that was what the clouds were like when he witnessed his father being gunned down in front of him at the age of five. <coughs> And I've seen, and I know his family still, the absolute devastation that just, mm -hmm. it's like a ripple. It just continues, it continues, it continues. So I think it's in all of our interests that we do mm -hmm. try to address these issues, but I'm mindful of what I'd said at the start. There's never going to be a single interpretation of history mm -hmm. and past events, but I just wanted to put on record my own view, which is mm -hmm. similar to Trevor's. I also I have a family relative who was shot uh, in 1970 and since that time, this is an elderly lady we're talking about, ever since that time has been on prescription medication. Now you wouldn't think of an elderly lady mm -hmm. as having a problem. Yeah. We're talking 50 years. Yeah of prescription medication. I'm just wondering um, what the, if you have any statistics on the drug and alcohol mm -hmm. dependency amongst mm -hmm. people who were victims or their immediate families, and if you would care to comment to that. Yeah. I mean, just just before you do, George, do you want to ask your question and then band them together and then we'll, we'll be near <coughs> the end? Do you have you a question that you That's wanted to ask as well? I have one more. I have another one. Oh, well, then we'll come back to you then. <laughs> <laughs> it's my subtle way of saying, can we 
Hurry up. <laughs> <laughs> we're getting there. I, I remember Wait. you on Monday and Tuesday. <laughs> Monday and Tuesday when I'm in the chair. Um, and the, the, the second then issue, and it was identified as a potential problem in the historical institutional abuse stuff in terms of contacting people outside of Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of uh, contacting or, or advertising to people outside of Northern Ireland in terms of help that's available, just how does that work? How do you do that? Those are just the two questions. Okay. Um, George? Thanks, Chair, and uh, thanks to the team as well for your presentation. Um, I'll be very brief. Um, right now, at the present time, there's still so-called dissidents and so forth, mm -hmm. both sides, loyalist stand, Republicans, mm -hmm. and they're still victims. They've been tarnished and so forth and uh, badly mm -hmm. injured and so forth, egg wounds and all sorts of things. Are, will, they still be, will they still be compensated? Will there still be a compensation scheme, in other words, for the, for the most recent people that yeah. have been uh, victimised? Which order will I go in? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. I, I do agree with both my colleagues there yeah. in their presentations. Uh, Christopher, I know, I know you're, what you're saying, and you're right about, you know, there are always different experiences, but there will always be also be facts. Mm -hmm. Even though people may experience them differently, you're right. Um, and that, yes, we all have choices and we have different experiences. We make our choices on the different pressures sometimes, but we have choices. Um, I don't think either of those things run against the need to have. And where I start from is, no matter who you are, no matter who may have harmed you, you have the same rights. And that is the right to know that the state cares enough to investigate what happened to you in a competent, independent way. The right to know um, if there is no prosecution coming out of that. And, well, no, the right to know the status of your investigation, where it's at. Is anyone still doing it? Is it lying on a shelf? Is it going to be connected to something else? Is it going to come up again? Um, if there's a prosecution or no prosecution, you have the right to challenge that. And you have a right to a written um, explanation of why. You have the right to um, support and you've got the right to protection. And I would argue that for the 1,100 deaths that remain with our historical, oh, sorry, police legacy investigation branch, and it's not to do with the desire not to help on people work there, but there is simply not the capacity for them to deliver on those things, those rights, for anyone, no matter which side of the table or where people sit. There are people who've suffered that loss, who have those rights, um, the facts will emerge, and they will be what they will be. And I suggest they'll be uncomfortable for everybody. Not personally, there are many people who did no harm and no wrong. But in terms of community and narrative, the truth is messy and uncomfortable for all of us. But I agree very fundamentally with what you're saying about we need to deal with it in the interests of everybody. And we've heard in this room today how deep these things run throughout Northern Ireland and throughout its people. So I think you've highlighted some really important issues. Prescription medication, absolutely. There is documentary evidence, which I'm sure my team can provide you with, around the, I mean, extremely high levels of prescription in Northern Ireland, going right back to the Troubles and continuing since back in Paris and everything else. Can I see a statistic somewhere that the majority of cocodamil in the world yeah. is consumed in the city of Belfast. It's, it, it is <clears throat> absolutely, you know, it, it, was the only, it was the only tool in the GP's mm. toolkit. Yeah. And I, I, I'm not blaming people for doing it, but mm -hmm. you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Lifelong habituation, dependency, dependence on other substances as well is a direct and indirect result of trauma and prescribed medication. Um, we certainly have figures that show how high that is in Northern Ireland compared with elsewhere. We certainly have research that shows the comorbidity, the connection mm. between dependency and the high levels of drug dependency and alcohol dependency and other dependencies in Northern Ireland and trauma, and often contract-related trauma. <coughs> and as the people have said here, where do you draw the line around the edges of conflict-related trauma? 
Is it the person who's at the incident? Is it the child who grows up in a home where their parents look under the car every day for reasons they don't understand? Or are frightened of dark clouds for reasons they don't understand? Or react in a way when they hear a helicopter or see a police jeep in a way that their children don't understand? Those things affect children, their lives, and they affect the grandchildren. So, so which of those people are considered to be victims of the troubles and eligible for trauma or not? It's very, very wide-ranging and interconnected. And there is evidence, I don't know if there's an exact number, but there is lots of evidence of what you described around prescribed medication, trauma, addiction, and trauma, and the troubles trauma. And, and this is why with major mental health issues that we just need to deal with. And whilst there's a model in that regional trauma network, the money that's being talked about at the moment is nowhere near. Absolutely nowhere near. This is big. This is something we have to deal with. Um, uh, problems contacting people outside Northern Ireland. Yes, I think it is difficult. I think we've done, made some attempts to look at how you might try and do that, and I don't think we've come up with any solutions. Um, I'm thinking of Operation and John Boucher setting up an inquiry here where it was going to be very difficult to know who might be oh. coming forward to be spoken to or want to be engaging with the, with the team. Um, and a website was used uh -huh. and it was publicised and people could contact via the website or via a team. You know, I actually think if you seriously get into new developments and you want to let people know about them, like the victim's payment, you know, we need a public understanding of why these issues matter. We need a public awareness of what services that are and should be. Um, and I, th I would suggest that is a government awareness campaign, such as we've done in area, other areas previously. I really think there's a big piece of work here for us all to understand and acknowledge how deep this stuff is and why it really doesn't matter who you are or what the source of your trauma was, we all need to acknowledge that has to be dealt with. Um, I think, have I answered your questions, Chris, if I was going to come on to George? Just... Yes, you have. Thank you. Fine. Um, George, yeah, my advice, well, the legislation I operate on under doesn't have an end date. And whilst I would never legitimise violence at any point, and certainly not ongoing violence in this day and age, I still recognise that people who are the victims of that violence are victims of something which has its roots back in our conflict. Even if it's an indirect relationship in some cases, I'm not justifying anyone's behaviour or tracing it right back to a particular... But I'm saying, if you're taken by paramilitaries and beaten up and brutalised, as young people still are, you're a victim of, of a, an ugly legacy are passed. They still qualify. In the legislation that has been passed for the victim's payment, it actually says that incidents up to 2010 are included, which is an improvement on what was proposed before. It then says on a case-by-case -case basis, other ones can be looked at. So it's not a given, but it's within scope. It's better than it looked at the stage at which they insulted. It's not as inclusive as I would have liked it to be, but it's better than it was when they considered it. Okay, that's thank you. Okay, um, Judith, Paul, Leslie and Andrew, can I thank you, um, first of all, for um, both thank you for coming along here today and giving us that presentation and also apologise that we've kept you for an hour and 45 minutes. <laughs> I think sometimes it can escape us as individual contributors that collectively we are putting us through an hour and 45 minutes of questioning <laughs> on issues that maybe aren't always easy to discuss or talk about and we do sincerely thank you for, for making that contribution to us today. So... Chair, can I thank you for the opportunity? Yep. Yeah. Honestly, we'd sit here all day happily yeah. if you would have us. It's important. The members. We value the fact <laughs> that you give us this much time. Okay. Thank, thank you. you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, it's all right. I was going to say. Thank you. I did bring my hand back, didn't I? I did. I <laughs> 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 believe it was there.
Thank you. Okay, members, we'll uh, just to finish off from that okay. session, then we have, um, I suppose, at least this one maybe item that sort of came up earlier on in the conversation about um, maybe writing to the Secretary of State to ask for an update on progress in relation to the introduction of the legislation um, that was mentioned earlier. Would members be agreeable to that? Yep. Great. Okay, are there any other items that, as outcomes from that that members would wish to raise? Okay, uh, in that case then we can move on to our next uh, presentation on the outcomes delivery plan. Good afternoon. You are sure. very welcome. Thank you for coming along. Our apologies for uh, commencing 45 minutes late. We oh, apologise sure. to you for that. I know you have been uh, outside the door waiting. Um, we will allow you maybe just move on, Chris, maybe to yourself to introduce your team and then maybe uh, do a short presentation and then we can move into questions and answers on the outcomes delivery plan. Thank you, Chair. Happy to do that. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, uh, members. Very pleased to have the opportunity to be back uh, with you today to brief you on the outcomes delivery plan. And I have with me uh, Caroline Gillan, who's the director, program uh, government for division in TO, and Geoffrey Simpson, uh, who works with Caroline. That division is responsible for developing, managing, and reporting on the delivery of the outcomes delivery plan and the Northern Ireland Executive's program for government. Chair, I trust that the paper for today's meeting will have given members uh, a brief summary of the background to the development of the ODP. I'll pick up some key issues uh, on that before going on to outline how it's intended to build on that to develop a programme for government. Members will recall ODP was originally developed as an interim measure during the period when we had uh, no ministers. And the starting point was the framework of 12 outcomes that had been developed by the previous executive and which reflect the key areas of economic and societal well-being that people said mattered most to them. And taken together, those outcomes provided a direction for the work of departments which fully respected the strategic direction that had been set by the former executive and which enjoyed very broad support. And we had committed to reporting progress uh, against the ODP and two reports have been published to date, the first in December 2018 and then again in September 2019. And these reports detail the progress made uh, towards the 12 outcomes, with each outcome owner, which is essentially the permanent secretaries, making a statement of overall progress, together with an update on key individual actions. Following that, an updated uh, ODP was developed in the autumn of 2019 and published in December of that year, and hopefully there's a copy of that in uh, members' packs. And that has a renewed focus on the actions likely to have the biggest impact across public services and programmes in the immediate future. That latest version of the plan uh, wasn't intended to cover a fixed period, but instead our intention was for it to be maintained as a live document that can be amended or added to as priorities and actions change. And to support that new approach and to enable the presentation of dynamic information relevant to each outcome, officials have also been developing new monitoring and reporting web pages which will be accessible to the public. Those web pages will now be adapted to reflect the outcomes and actions in the forthcoming PFG to be agreed by the executive, and our hope is that those will be ready to go live uh, later this year. Chair, the ODP has been central to public service delivery since June 2018, identifying priorities and driving actions for change across the public sector. Its use of the outcomes framework and its responsive approach provide an appropriate foundation now to develop a programme for government. So at this point it might be useful just to remind ourselves what the new decade, new approach agreement said <coughs> about the process and approach that the parties agreed for developing a programme for government. There are a number of key points in, in the agreement and they are firstly the initial use of the ODP as a basis for setting out an immediate work programme. 
a commitment that the future PFG will focus on prosperity and well-being for all, a promise that it will be developed through engagement and co-design, and a commitment to accountability and transparency in terms of monitoring its progress. The agreement also provided the basis for a two-stage approach to developing the programme for government, and the Executive has now agreed that approach. The first stage is to develop an immediate PFD to reflect the Executive's immediate priorities. That stage is well underway and is hoped to have that programme for government for the year 2020-2021, ready by uh, the coming April. In coming weeks, as part of that process, officials will undertake a targeted engagement uh, with a range of key stakeholders. We in TEO will lead that uh, centrally, given that fairly compressed timescale, but we very much view that just as the start of ongoing engagement uh, and co-design in this whole area. And Chair, I hope it goes without saying that in addition to engaging with, with stakeholders, we're more than happy to engage with this committee uh, as you see fit in that process. Developing an immediate PFG in this way, although it's very challenging in terms of the time scale and indeed the affordability of new priorities against the background of existing pressures, nevertheless has the advantage of allowing the executive to set out clearly its priorities and actions for the immediate priority ahead. Beyond that, the second stage will be the development of a long-term, multi-year strategic programme for government aligned to a multi-year budget, which will follow the spending review, and also aligned to a legislative programme and our aim is to have that ready by April 2021. As I mentioned earlier, then, an essential feature of that work is citizen engagement and co-design and working up the proposed outcomes, priorities and actions. That will be followed in due course by a more formal consultation on a draft PFG. In terms of timing for the second stage, we would see engagement and development, the development taking place between now and August, then a, a draft PFG formally going out for consultation around about September or October, alongside the consultation on the post-2021 budget, and then hopefully agreement on a multi-year PFG early in the calendar year 2021, then to begin in that financial year. Chair, that's a very quick skip uh, over the ground. Happy to answer any questions or expand on any of that. Um, okay, so members will come in with, I'm sure, questions now, but I suppose just to clarify, we're looking, I suppose, at the nuts and bolts of the development of the development, um, the development plan along with the programme for government as opposed to necessarily the content that's actually in it. So just, uh, but it will be a stroke of genius for politicians to be able to weave both into their questions and, and I'll maybe begin um, by saying about how do you ensure that what's contained within the outcomes is kept realistic? I mean, who would, would keep that check and, and, and how is that worked with individual departments and um, individual government um, agencies. And my example of that being that if we're going to talk about um, regional equality and, and we're talking about uh, investment working right across the whole of the north, you know, how can Invest NI get away with doing over 250 of its visits in Belfast and less than 80 around the rest of the north, which includes the chair and I think vice chair of this committee's constituencies having zero visits over a three year period. So obviously something, they're very high level statements, but how do we keep them grounded and realistic if agencies are going to just go way off the mark uh, whenever it comes to the actual delivery on the ground? You'll appreciate, Chair, I'm not trying to avoid the detail of that question, but I'm not really in a position to comment on the distribution of Invest Northern Ireland uh, visits. Happy to take that back and pass it on to colleagues in economy uh, and, and bring you an answer on that. In terms of the overall question, I think one of the things that we see as, as very important is to take this forward closely linked to the budget, even in terms of the initial programme for government. There's a great deal in NDNA to be delivered. It's a very ambitious agreement. Um, the executive is currently considering how to deliver on NDNA, um, I think through both the initial programme for government and then the multi-year one that, that will follow. And that's also against the background of, to be candid, the financial settlement of, uh, associated with the agreement not being as generous as, I think, as any of the parties uh, wished for, and very considerable existing pressures right, right across all government departments. So there's a lot to be done on a limited budget. That will require very careful consideration. It means we need to do our work very closely with our colleagues in the Department of Finance to make sure that it is uh, realistic and affordable. 
Then drilling down beyond that, whether it comes to invest Northern Ireland visits or any other aspect of, of individual delivery, it's incumbent, I think, on outcome owners uh, and departments to demonstrate what it is that they're contributing to the achievement of, of the outcomes and, and how they're doing that. And if concerns do arise about whether or not a particular action or approach isn't delivering on an outcome or isn't delivering on an outcome in a way that demonstrates equality, then that's something that I'm sure this committee, individual committees, or an overall uh, committee, if the executive, if the assembly decides to establish one, will want to probe very, very carefully. And it's something that we will want to be very conscious of in our monitoring and stewardship of the PFG overall. And, and do you see that, that, that information being real time, so that rather than having to wait until the end of a period of time and asking assembly questions that goes back the way to say what happened two and three years ago and then say <coughs> that was terrible, that actually there will be a real life uh, dashboard that we could look at and actually see, well, at this point in the year, you're not going to hit those targets, so we need the intervention now. Yeah, I mean, Chair, you're absolutely right around the outcomes being very high level and where we want, there's a, equally a need to have a focus on at action level and it's there that we would expect um, departments, outcome owners to be able to report and evidence the impact they're having at action level, you know, how much they did, how well did they do it, who's better off and we're expecting a great use of data right across um, Section 75 groups, <coughs> council areas. In terms of the reporting and the live reporting, the web pages once developed will have live reporting, both you know, in terms of the indicators and as new data comes online, but also hopefully eventually at action level, where we'll be able to see how individual actions are going and there'll be data in behind that. Um, eventually as well, the indicators will be broken down where possible into Section 75 groups and also into council areas. So there's a bit more you know, um, on the ground um, reporting than just at a very, very high level. Um, we're under no illusions, Chair. I mean, if that is successful and the data is genuinely accessible, mm -hmm. then citizens and stakeholders will challenge mm -hmm. us on yeah. individual delivery uh, and on, on the overall outcomes, and we will need to respond to that. Okay. And then just finally, in terms of a, a additional areas, I know that certainly um, we were quite keen, given the, the crisis that there can be within housing uh, and homelessness and, uh, and appropriate housing, that we wanted to see it as a separate section within the programme for government and then obviously being drilled down in, into these reports. Um, is that being considered at this stage or is it, I mean, what's the process, I suppose, for including something? Is it a formal request? Is it an executive decision or um, how is that extra, can an extra area be put on the program. Ultimately, it's for the, the executive to, to sign off. I, I wouldn't be at all surprised. <coughs> yes, if it goes in that direction, uh, something you and I will both recall featured very prominently in the talks that, that led to NDNA. Yeah. Very high degree of consensus across all the parties of, of a need to do something different on, on housing. So I wouldn't be at all surprised if the executive decides to do exactly that, perhaps going as far as an additional or a new outcome <coughs> on housing. Whether that's in the initial programme for government or the subsequent one, I think perhaps more likely. It is an executive decision, but I think much more likely that it would be in the subsequent multi-year programme for government. Thank you very much. Um, Mike? Chair, yeah, thank you very much. Um, Caroline, could you give me a sense of, of your role for you and your unit in terms of inputs, outputs, outcomes? Yeah, well, we, we're sort of the central role. There's a number of teams involved in terms of developing the actual document and uh, the content and working with officials right across the system to um, decide what um, should be in the programme for government and obviously, you know, with ministers. So we have a central coordinating role, but also in thinking about how we design the monitoring apparatus. Um, programme for government website is one of the options, but also we need to think about uh, the overall monitoring through to the executive and obviously the assembly themselves will want to look at their role in that. Um, but more widely than that, we also have a piece of work to do around programme for government and outcomes delivery and collaboration across the civil service and wider public sector. So we are looking at how we become a much more outcomes focused, collaborative um, system and civil service. The Outcomes Delivery Plan has provided a great opportunity in terms of a dry run for working in this way. Um, and we've learned a lot from that in terms of how well we collaborate, how we break down silos. But we are working with colleagues from um, uh, the Applied Learning Centre around training, around uh, leadership um, courses, and more widely around communications and the whole work. So there's a number of elements. I, I'm assuming that 
When it comes to data, it's not the gathering that is the issue, it's the analysis. Yes, I should have actually. My colleagues in the PFG Analytics Unit will be um, uh, sitting back at their desks wondering why I haven't mentioned them. Yes, we have a team of statisticians. So there's statisticians in every department who um, work on obviously um, gathering evidence and advising policy colleagues around what evidence they should gather. We have a team of statisticians within TEO, particularly looking at the data centrally on, on programme for government, precisely because it's all about knowing are we actually making a difference, are we gathering the right data. Um, they lead on, uh, along with NISRA central colleagues, looking at do we have the right indicators. We have 49 of them at the moment, um, and we'll want to do some sort of professional review internally around are they telling us the right things, are some working better than others, and are there others that we could suggest or tweak. So there's, that's an important role as well. <coughs> some, some say the, the danger with outcomes-based, and I certainly think outcomes-based is the way to go, but the danger with it is that if you have outcomes you're trying to meet targets for, that you ultimately <coughs> are tempted to massage the data to deliver <coughs> on paper what hasn't been delivered on the ground. Is that a fear you, you share? I mean, it's not, a, it's not a fear or something that we've particularly come across. I mean, at the end of the day, the data is a tool to allow us to see you know, what areas do we need to target for a start? Where are the problem areas? But then also to monitor, are we actually making a difference? And the strength is if we have an intervention or program that we have good data and we continue to collect the data and it shows that it's not making a difference, we have the evidence to say we either tweak it or we stop it entirely, um, or if it's working, then we do more of it. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's so much as massaging the figures, but using the using it as a great tool to show that we're doing the right things to to create the biggest impact. I think if, if we genuinely make the data accessible and mm -hmm. if it's if it's probed and challenged and, and analysed, then you know we'll, we'll get a number of different perspectives on it. I think one of the other things we're we're seeing increasingly is as the science of handling the data develops different and new ways of, of using the information. Just before I left economy, when we're in the foothills of developing a new energy strategy, not surprisingly, one of the things that that will look at is the decarbonisation of transport. Um, but that also, that generates a lot of data around things like reducing CO2 levels, but also reducing levels of other air pollutants. And you can map that now in a very sophisticated way and draw out the contours of develop of uh, air pollutants uh, around major roads. You can link that very easily to health data sets. So you can very quickly from that, you can see the measurable outcome of an energy strategy on a number of key health conditions. And that's something that 10 years ago, we simply wouldn't have thought about doing. So the use of the data, I think, yes, there are always dangers, I think, in it that, we, that we need to guard <coughs> against. But I think there's also a potential for using it in new and, and richer ways that allow us to, to map the outcomes in, I think, much much more sophisticated way than we've done before. Mark Friedman um, briefed the Legacy Committee a few years ago. Now, this is a man who is credited with coming up with outcomes-based accountability in government. Uh, and he was asked by, this, by the Legacy Committee, is there a, an obvious error to avoid? And his answer was, yes, there is. Uh, and it is, don't try and do it all at once. But we are trying to do it all at once. How difficult is it? It's very difficult. Um, at the end of the day, I mean, as I say, there, there's a great deal, there's always a great deal for an executive to deliver. There's a great deal for the executive to deliver an NDNA. There's a great deal of existing pressure uh, right across departments. The executive will have to make difficult decisions around uh, what it prioritises. Our job, I think, along with colleagues, is to make sure that the executive's armed with, with the data and the information uh, to allow those informed choices to be made, and crucially, I think, to be explained <coughs> to citizens and for us all to be accountable for that. Final question. Uh, NDNA, page 41.18, talks about the Fiscal Council and the fact that they will uh, provide independent assessment of the, of the delivery. Do you welcome that, and how far advanced are we in establishing the Fiscal Council? Uh, of course I welcome that, given that the agreement has been uh, signed up to by all five parties and therefore has the executive ah, simple matter. So, no, yes. no, 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 it hasn't. <laughs> uh, well, it's, uh, the, the agreement... Has been fully endorsed by all five parties? I stand corrected. It was nevertheless the basis on which the executive returned, uh, therefore it has the executive support, therefore it has mine.
And how far advanced are we in establishing the council? Uh, it's still early days, but I understand colleagues in the Department of Finance who are leading on it are working on proposals. Thank you. Okay, Pat. Thanks, Chair. Thanks for coming in. Um, just a couple of short questions. We know the executive has had two away days in the past eight weeks. Uh, <coughs> we're going to approach the, the, a draft programme for government. Can you report any progress? Yes, uh, now, you know, we're not at the point yet where there's a draft to, to share or, or a draft budget, but those were two, I think, very productive discussions. That was the view of ministers, not of me. Uh, where there was time through that approach to explore not just the things that usually land on ministers' desks in a very pressurised way, i.e. the list of pressures to be met, but they were able to take time to explore the outcomes in some detail and the linkages between them. Uh, and I think that was very helpful in informing the thinking uh, that, that we're moving forward with now. But as I say, we're not yet at the point where I can tell you we're you know, about to reveal a draft programme for government. Still some way to go. Do you have any ballpark timeline at all? Well, we have a timescale that we're aiming for. I mean, we need, we need to have this. Uh, <laughs> if, if we're to uh, meet the expectations in the NDNA, we need to have this by April. Yeah. And of course, there's a fixed timescale for the budget, <coughs> uh, which has to be before the beginning of the financial year. And to make this work as effectively as, as we all aim for, then we need to keep the PFG in step with the budget. And what do you anticipate in terms of consultation around the draft PFG? We tend to talk about engagement rather than consultation for this particular part of the process, simply because of the time scales involved. I not remember them all, but we do have a list. Jeffrey, mm -hmm. if I might turn to you. We have a list of um, stakeholder organisations yeah. that, that we've, we've asked yeah. to engage with, and I've no doubt that'll be added to. So we'll have a programme uh, arranged over the next two or three weeks. So we're, we're meet, meeting with a, a range of industry uh, uh, bodies, first of all. Um, we're meeting local government associations with Solus and Nilga. Uh, we're meeting with the farming community through Ulster Farmers Union, uh, Neapa and the Rural Community Network. Um, with an event arranged with NICFA, Community and Voluntary Sector, uh, with the Equality Coalition, lined up for another event, um, a NIC2 meeting happening next week, uh, and then we're meeting with all five of the commissioners as well, that's children, children, young people, Quality Commission, human rights, victims and the older people. And, and what's the distinction you're making between engagement and consultation? Well, I suppose the engagement's the start of a, 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 almost a consultation process, as it were. I mean, this is going to be an ongoing process to help us shape um, the initial programme uh, that we bring forward in April. That's going to be a live document, we hope, um, so that that'll feed in later as well, so we can keep that engagement going in relation to the 2020-21 programme, but also it'll be the beginning of the process of helping shape the 21 it's, it's uh, just to long term program. draw the distinction between you know that, that bit of engagement or consultation that, that people would often see, which is a draft document is produced and there's eight weeks or 12 weeks or whatever to respond to it. Uh, I mean, that's never enough anyway. Uh, there needs to be more engagement upstream before you get to the point of, of drafting a document. Um, what we're doing in this particular phase is largely shaped simply by the time scale and, and what, what the time that is available to do it. The work that we'll do, which starts now, on the multi-year programme for government will be longer, much more intense and much broader. And it's also worth remembering that the 12 outcomes that we're working to as a basis just for this initial year were the result of a really extensive public consultation a couple of years ago around what was important to people. So we do, you know, we're confident around the public consultation around the high outcome level. Um, but as Chris said, this is when we move into the multi-year, we'll have a much more thorough look again, saying, well, "What is? Are these still important to you? Have things changed? Do you see different outcomes being important or phrased in a slightly different way?" But it's very much a continuous process. I'm just slightly concerned, given the fact that co-design is used extensively throughout yeah. the plan. Uh, you know that you can move ahead without any serious consultation. Uh, so the ongoing consultation at outcome owner level with, with their particular stakeholder groups, and that's where the co-design really comes in, because it's co-design of actions that's going to, uh, to make the big difference. And we'd, we'd like this even to be a live document, even within year one. So if certain areas, because life changes and um, things come along, if, if um, certain actions need to be prioritised <coughs> or new actions need to be put in place, obviously based on 
proper engagement and co-design from a co-owner level, then those will be put in the documents. So it's not a static document at the end, you know, that we're going to put out in April and it's going to stay that way. But you're right, and you know, I think we have to candidly observe that the the emphasis on on co-design and the timescale in the document is a very considerable cont uh, tension between them, particularly in this first phase. And there isn't time to do as much as I think we would like, or our ministers would, would like. We'll do as much as we can in the time available. We'll look to do a great deal more of that in the second phase. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Trevor Clark. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I was just looking at, in terms of the the framework. This is something used on whilst the executive was no longer in existence. Not, not right. Yes. Uh, yeah. Well, well, the framework goes back to 2016 and the yeah. objective was in place. But, but you've continued to work on the basis of that. We've kept that going. The ODP, yeah. yes. In terms of your outcomes number three and number 12, and I know this is a departmental target rather than an uh, example target, but in terms of gap between the percentage of non free school meals and the free school percentage of free school meal leavers achieving a level two or above in English or maths, how, how do you hope? How do they hope that they're going to achieve something like that? So I since I've looked at those figures, when or, I or can I maybe qualify? It? Sorry, Chris, I'll just qualify it. because actually, and on the framework, it's actually saying about improving the well-being for all and by tackling disadvantage. Yep. Let me, if I may, deal, deal with the first part of that uh, first. If I recall those figures correctly, and I may have changed, the difference would have been roughly 34% to 68%, something like that. So a huge difference between uh, the, those uh, two populations. Drilling down to those e even more, um, if you look at the performance of individual schools, there are lots of instances of seeing schools um, serving communities that have similar levels of socio-economic deprivation, but having very significant differences in their performances. So some schools doing doing much better th than others. That, if you like, is, is the genesis of the target, which is to say that children and young people who are growing up in socio-economic deprivation, it's not inevitable that they come out with uh, fewer qualifications. Something can be done about that. At, at the risk of, of describing it superficially, I think the factors that contribute to that are, are well understood. It's the standard of teaching in the classroom and the standard of governance uh, in, in the school boardroom and providing the support to teachers and school governors then to, to do that well. Well, that's, 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 those, are, those, those are the areas where the interventions uh, And there's expect. crossover between your outcome yes. 3 and your outcome yep. 12. Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. But I suppose, in terms of what you've said, Chris, leads me on to where I want to really be. In one hand, you're saying it's about <coughs> tackling these particular issues in particular areas. However, the, the document, the, the improving well-being for all by tackling disadvantage, and you talk about maybe teaching styles, but would you not accept, even in terms of teaching styles, that if I think of many villages where you can have a Catholic maintained school, a controlled school, and a integrated school, and all fund it differently, so um, you would suggest nearly that someone would be probably would be unfair to, or not to suggest rather that someone who goes to an integrated school will get more per head of population than those who go to the Catholic school or the Protestant school as it's perceived. How then is this target? tackling disadvantage, but you're leaving behind the funding mechanism where the real disadvantage is taking place. You're, you're tempting me to go back uh, to, to areas that both Carol and I uh, both worked in and where I'd probably misremember the, 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 the detail. I think that does take us into something fairly fundamental in, in NDNA as an agreement that's related to that, and that's the transformation of, of education. And that is something which features prominently in the agreement, and I know features a lot in uh, the thinking of departmental colleagues and, and indeed the minister there, and, and we'll see proposals on that on, on, on due course. But I think it's recognised the current um, education in the state, the current education system, uh, has some excellent high-performing schools within all of the sector, but isn't sustainable and needs to change. So that pattern of, of schools that, that uh, you've described is going to have to change for sustainability reasons, uh, not because of, of um, any judgment on the value of a particular type of, of school or, or sector. And that's going to require fairly fundamental recasting of the education system. And within that, I think if there are uh, anomalies or perceived anomalies in, in the funding arrangements, I'm sure that's something that can be examined. And that sounds like a reasonable explanation, except this work's been going on since June 2018. The NDNA came 
early this year. So why was that left out in terms of the outcomes for this, in terms of rebalancing the education and actually tackling the disadvantage? Because there's disadvantage in education. Someone in a school where they're going to get more money is going to get, well, you'd assume should get a better outcome than those who are not funded appropriately. But you, you focus on free school meals. So I think the other thing to remember is the outcomes are the focus. Those indicators are not targets at all. They merely sit alongside as indicators that we might check to say, are we moving in the right direction for the outcome? So those are not the end of the story. It's not that the education actions or the actions under either of those two outcomes are, are solely focused in those areas. Those are just purely indicators. The focus is on the wider outcome, which then doesn't constrain you in relation to... But, but the targets mischievous are... Well, the outcomes mischievous because where, where you talk about a percentage of non-free school means and the percentage of free school mean labourers leaving each level, sorry, achieving a level two or above... Actually, that doesn't matter what sector they go to because each of those sectors will be getting free school means. So for me, actually, there is more uh, disadvantage in the education system than a measure by free school means. The, dis the real disadvantage is actually how each of the models are funded, where you can see in some sectors they're getting three times the amount of money per head as another sector. And to me, that causes a greater disadvantage. And whilst I'm not speaking primarily for... Uh, Protestant boys, because I think everyone should be treated equally, but the outcomes for Protestant males are as much worse than other sectors. So for me, then that would have said, I see that should have been rebalanced in terms of an outcome. I see to rebalance all sectors and treat everyone as equal and removing the disadvantage, as opposed to focusing only on free school males, because each and every sector will get free school males. I think what's been articulated there is the importance of understanding the story and behind the indicator and understanding what the data is actually t saying there and that's that's the challenge for for the outcome owners to get their heads around what that actually means and what what, what it's telling us and where do we need to go and where do we need to put our, oh, our Jeff, focus on it's, it's not doing that but but, and, but that's what people have to, I suppose, to sorry, do. I, I, if I get I, just to add on to this here I think what we're saying is this is about the nuts and bolts I get what you're saying which is about the actual physical outcome itself and querying it and that that's proper but I suppose maybe you aren't the educational experts that yeah. put that outcome there. So maybe the query is more general in the sense of what happens if there's an outcome that doesn't adequately reflect what's on the ground. I think, I think, that's, I think that's right. And I think it, it, you're absolutely right in that we mustn't rely solely on one indicator. Uh, absolutely right. There are many dimensions to uh, underachievement, uh, not all of which can be measured solely through uh, entitlement to, to free school meals. And that, I think, reinforces the point made earlier. The need for us to have a richness of data to make it accessible uh, and amenable to, to analysis and, and probing. Uh, I mean, the, the, um, the outcome for um, Protestant boys in, in uh, associated private communities, I think that's been well recognised for, for many, many years. And you're absolutely right that uh, you don't see that part of the story simply by looking at free school meals. Mm -hmm. So there are other indicators, other sources of data that need to be looked at. Um, Emma. Thanks, Chair, and thank you for your presentation. I just have a wee question um, in relation to the programme for government um, that, that you're outlining there and some of the commitments that were made in NDNA. Not to keep going back, but there's some time bound um, commitments in, in, in relation to the language uh, legislation and the language and culture commissioners. The strategies that are outlined, I'm just wondering how close are we? Because I know obviously there was. Sort of deadlines of like the end of March for, for having a plan in place. So I just wondered. The work is underway. I, I can't, I'm afraid, give you a detailed picture today on the, the, the race, language, and culture part of, of the document, but either we can provide you with that information or better still, I could pass it to my colleague Mark Brown uh, and okay. ask him to do it. Uh, I know, obviously, given the centrality of uh, those actions to the agreement and their political significance. Uh, it is a priority and work is underway in the department on taking those forward. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, Fran? Refreshing. Yeah, last but not least. No, no, no still no. more. You're not last. Yeah, more. Thank you for the presentation. It's, it's certainly interesting. And just picking up <coughs> on uh, one of the, the, the issues that uh, Trevor recently I do get it, I do understand it. Uh, but usually, free school means is a, a sure indicator of uh, deprivation 
uh, with with and, and communities in many of us, whether it's in whatever community in Bobachil is going to school uh, without any food, it's certainly going to impact on their on their education. And I think some of the stuff that has taken place within broader West Belfast, I'm talking about all of it uh, more recently, is collaborative working between schools, primary schools, secondary schools, and it's starting to uh, the, the, to pay dividends. And I think that uh, obviously what we need to do is to ensure that the thing uh, that is funded uh, properly, and that we need to encourage that, that time, that kind of, of, of working. But uh, to go back to the, uh, and Pat had raised the whole question about con consultation, and certainly in other committees that I was on, and I understand that you are working within a, 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 a difficult time frame. Uh, but well, and, uh, I used to get a beam up on it about the whole thing, as you know, when, when we talk consultations, we talk about usual suspects, and you just read out the list of usual suspects uh, that, that, that are going to be brought in to, uh, to, 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 to talk the thing out. Now, the, uh, and I, I thought that we had got over the stage uh, where we just relied on that and uh, brought people in, talked to them, got an opinion, went away, and that, uh, that we started to broaden out the whole discussion of things. Because what we are doing has to impact on everybody. Not just a, a number of the sectors uh, that are there, and I think that's the crucial element of of the, uh, especially in, in terms of outcomes uh, uh, towards things. Because one of the difficulties you've had uh, in, in the past, and I do understand that, that, that maybe uh, departments could uh, just look at collaborative working in terms of uh, what, what's happening in, in, in other sectors. Uh, it's how you you, you deal with. Departments that feel that they're not ready or to want to move into that uh, space where the only way forward is collaborative work, and if, if they're going to deliver the outcomes that we require to move everything forward. Yeah, I think that's right. Could I maybe just pick up the um, um, the engagement um, piece first, and then, then come back to to free school meals? You're absolutely right, I and mean, we don't want to, you know, stop at the usual suspects. To to, to borrow your phrase, if if you think even on, on the list that we've produced that there are obvious gaps that we've missed, you know, we're more than happy to take, take suggestions, absolutely happy to, to in, engage with this committee. To be candid, we would love to be doing much more than that, even in the first phase, but NDNA set a ferocious timescale for us in, in terms of doing this, and it will be very difficult for us to do, I think, much more th than we have outlined in that first phase. But the second phase starts now, and well, in essence, actually doesn't finish. Uh, with a, that's, that's going to be an ongoing process and actually, just of engagement. You're absolutely right. Just to reassure you, in terms of looking at how do we engage with actual real people on the ground, we are starting to develop um, sort of a, an approach and a strategy which is looking much more around: can we get focus groups of a good cross section of, of society? Can we go to people where they actually? are living and working and carrying out different day-to-day um, -day, um, activities rather than expecting people to come to us, which very often people don't. Um, we're looking at online opportunities and yeah. um, going to significant events so that we can actually talk to people who happen to be there, for example, say the Balmoral show or something like that. Certainly, so it's I can assure you, we're, we're, we're never going back to the old days yeah. where you put a document out for eight weeks and everybody told yeah. you what was wrong with it. Um, yeah. That didn't work uh, and we're not going back mm -hmm. to that. If we could just pick up the, the free school me this point, uh, and, and to agree with you, it's, and well, I think what we're saying is it's a very useful indicator, but it's not the only one. I think there, there are others that we need to look at, but it remains a very valid indicator. It is a very reliable proxy for socioeconomic deprivation. It does show us, I think most importantly of all, as I say, the difference in outcomes between schools that are serving communities of similar levels of socioeconomic deprivation. So we know that some schools have developed better practice in this area. And as you say then, we need to build then on that and build on the collaboration between schools and between, between school sectors, because it isn't inevitable that if someone is in receipt of, full, of free school meals, uh, that they're going to miss out on their educational experience. That can be addressed. There is good practice. We need to make sure that it's, that it's embedded. Yeah, just to, 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 sure, just one minute to, 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 go, to go back again and see. Uh, and the last assembly, um, the, the assembly before it, both in social development and then communities and some of the other uh, uh, the, the, the departments, 
one of the things that they started to do, mostly at the the the, the, the quest and insistence of the, the members of the, of the committee, uh, was look beyond what I call the usual suspects, look into uh, neighbourhood renewal partnerships, look into uh, what, whatever local farming organisations, whatever thing, yep. that exist. And I think because sometimes when you have these conversations with the usual suspects, they do not filter down yep. uh, to communities. Yep. And at least when you start to include people in uh, mm. the uh, discussions about how their life is going to be affected by what we do up here, then at least they will say, well, I had a say in creating yep. matters, shaping that. Absolutely okay. right. Uh, and, you know, and times past was not that long ago. We didn't really have the ability to consult directly with children and young people. Um, when I do, we've, we've had to learn that, and, and we're, we're still learning. But there are ways of doing it, so there's no excuse for not consulting and engaging directly with children and young people now, and any other uh, sector or group in society. How do you move? Uh, and how do you uh, deal with departments that uh, do not uh, buy into uh, the new way of thinking in terms of it, it comes and uh, the moving away from the silo approach uh, that would be how we hold. I'm, I'm glad to say there, there, I think there's quite considerable evidence of that uh, breaking down. Uh, uh, certainly ministers are very quick, I think, to, to, to see the linkages. But to take an example, one well, I know will resonate with, with, with many members, um, mental health. If you just look at mental health and mental health services as an issue for the Department of Health, then you simply wouldn't see anything like the whole story. But if you look at the incidence of, of mental illness amongst school-age children and how that affects uh, their ability to, to avail of educational opportunity, then you start uh, to, to see it differently. If you look at something like the Substance Abuse Court and Department of Justice and how successful that has been in dealing with substance abuse, but they will say it only works if the treatment programmes are available in health and social care to refer people to. So if you start looking at mental health and mental health provision through the lens of what it contributes to a whole range of outcomes uh, right across this, and then you know the holy grail is to get to the point where you want the Minister for Justice to spend some of her budget on health and social care because it's contributing to outcome seven. Uh, you, want, you, know, you want the Minister for Education to spend some of his, his budget on mental health because it's contributing to the, the outcomes that, that, that he has an interest in. Now, I'm not claiming we've got quite that far yet, but there's certainly a growing body of evidence, I think, of people recognising that what other departments can do for them and what they can do for other departments <coughs> in terms of outcomes. And I think it will really help as we go out to can develop the multi-year PFG alongside colleagues who are developing the multi-year budget. You know, joining those <coughs> two, di two discussions together is going to help in that regard. Thank you very much. Okay. Trevor? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, good to see you again. And you? Both of you. <laughs> All of you, sorry. <laughs> um, it, it, what strikes me about this is just that mm. it's so hugely ambitious and wide ranging. And it, it, it screams at me budget. <laughs> <coughs> uh, you did mention that, Chris, in your preamble. Um, is, is there any, I will put it another way, to what extent would there be reliance on European funding in the middle of all this? Um, I, can't, I can't claim to have thought about that in any great detail, Trevor, specifically on, on, on European funding. Um, but the budget challenge itself just is, is immense. Um, I think I mean, ministers are on record as having said that they're, they're disappointed with uh, the financial settlement that came along with the agreement. The budget itself, we're looking forward to, to see what the, the Chancellor comes out with, with nationally. I don't think anybody's expecting that to be an absolute game changer, but we're hoping that we'll, there will be some room to manoeuvre around that. But I think it cannot be denied that there are going to have to be difficult decisions made around the, the, the delivery of this. Uh, it's not about not doing things, and I think our ministers would very quickly uh, remind me that it's not about not doing things, but it's about when and, and how. So there are going to have to be difficult decisions made around prioritisation and, and the timing of the delivery of this. And clearly it's not all going to be delivered in the first initial programme for government. It's at least going to take us into the multi-year programme for government, and some of it perhaps beyond that. It's, it's generational, some of the stuff. I mean, take it all in totality, and it's, it's really the journey towards all those outcomes that matters, you know, where you want to just continually be doing better in all of them. I didn't, didn't mean that to be a negative. 
comment. I mean, I wish you a fair wind, and if you can deliver substantial sections of all this, that, that will be a real success. But uh, I'm listening to the, the discussion you had about the education system, and I'm thinking back, Chris. Takes us both back, yes. Yeah. I'm um, thinking back to the various initiatives that, over the years to try and modernise or change or transform our education system and the amount of time that we wasted getting nowhere in the Education Committee. I can remember two years in the Education Skills Authority. I do need to go on. And, uh, Thank you for that summary of my career. <laughs> <laughs> you did your best. But the, the, the fact is that, that you know we've been through all that and we still have three educational silos. You know, we've got the control maintained and integrated. And the other Trevor and I must have a wee short discussion sometime about the funding of schools because I think he's got the wrong end of the stick. But uh, beyond that, yeah. that, that's a tough one, you know, and I, I appreciate the minister we have now is relatively forward thinking and uh, maybe means business in terms of the transformation of the systems, the sectors, and the estate that has to be done. And I'm, I'm sure it's all in here. But. Um, you know, it, 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 even just that on its own, that's, that's huge. It, it There's is. so much else there which, which I really do wish you well with, but uh, good luck. Thank you for that. It, it, is, it is challenging. I, I will confine myself a little and not stray too far I into am. the territory of education or I'll get into trouble both with my colleagues and, and the Minister. But um, I think the need for transformation is, is clearly signalled in the document. It's been well understood for a long time. Um, people compare and contrast it, I suppose, with, with the transformation in health and social care. And I think there are comparisons that, that could be made there. One of the things that's sometimes suggested is that there's a need for a Bingoa-style review of, of education, and the executive might, might decide to go in, in that direction. If I could candidly observe, I think one of the difficulties there is that in health and social care, broadly speaking, there is... Uh, an accepted view of what the right way forward is. I think there is acceptance of the evidence base and where, where that is driving transformation uh, of the configuration of health and social care services. I don't think there's anything like the same level of agreement or consensus as to what an education system should look like. Thankfully, that's a challenge for politicians. You mentioned the word transformation. There's, there's two... Well, there's, yes, two definitions of that, word. yes. Thanks, Chair. OK, George. Thanks, Chair. Just be very, very brief. Uh, transport, does that come into the equation? Particularly the present time with Translink, the financial situation that, that they're in. And that impacts quite a lot. We talked about school children and so forth. Um, I think there's no, there's no better example of, of a set of immediate pressures uh, facing a department and also the need to take action uh, that will deliver some, some of the long-term outcomes. In terms of, of, of what the, the, the framework says, yes, uh, challenging, challenging and ambitious there, but you know, there needs to be a sustainable public, public transport system if, if that's going to be achieved. And yes, another committee will have heard from my colleague the very serious financial difficulties. Yes. Yeah. Okay, um, okay, that ends up most of the, the, the question and answers. Just one point to maybe highlight. You had said that the programme for Government 2021 should be drafted by April yes. of 20. Do you intend to brief the committee on that uh, and, and get a list? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Is that something that we could do at some point yeah. then travelling forward? Okay. Well, um, Chris, Caroline, Geoffrey, thank you very much indeed for you, giving Chairman. us that presentation today. And thank you. We'll take a moment to let you exit. So, uh, members, then item six is the uh, forward work plan. Um, so, if I can refer you to page 293. Um, we have been told that the legal advice that we had commissioned uh, regarding the historical institutional abuse uh, redress scheme is due at the end of the week and that a legal advisor will join us at our meeting on the 18th of March to discuss the legal advice in closed session. Our members... Uh, uh, yeah. just, just on that, uh, and I uh, 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 the opportunity, uh, some members had raised a, a number of weeks ago after the presentations that uh, some of the groups had raised concerns 
that some of the information that we were given about the panels and their ability to deal with uh, the, what's, what is expected, the large amounts of applications, may need not be uh, the, 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 the correct thing. And I think what we need to do is that uh, we're working to, 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 to ensure the, the right and proper outcomes of this here. We need to be careful that we don't fall the first hurdle. Okay. And, and, and if there's anything we can do on there. Yeah, but I'm just saying that there's another briefing that's due to come back to us, so that might be points that I'm we could sorry, raise. Sadly, I'm leaving. I know, so. I know. Uh, but maybe if we could you get your sad. colleagues to, to, to be um, well, well you look sad. updated <laughs> on that. Um, you want to come in on that? I'm just saying that You're not even hiding it. <laughs> we requested a further briefing from the department on the HIA, so I mean that can be addressed there. Also, um, we will be considering this issue on a sort of different, our strategic planning platform um, in April. Okay, happy enough. Thank yep. you very much. Okay, um, so remember it's happy to, to note the forward work plan yep. programme. Okay, um, item seven is correspondence, which is on 200, page 297 of the meeting pack, and it's a copy from the Social Investment Fund Investing Activity Report. Are members happy to note the report? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, um, then just we move on to item eight, uh, Chairman's business. I have just two items. Um, the first is, and it's without prejudice, I'm entirely in the committee's hands here, but can we take some sort of decision about our questioning and answering? Because we did leave officials sitting outside for 45 minutes today because the initial one had taken so long, and, and that has happened. We can, if members are happy with the way that we're actually progressing, <coughs> what we can do is we can stretch out the amount of time that's available uh, for um, presentations so that we don't leave people outside the door for a period of time. But I, I throw back to my only other experience on a committee, which was as the Education Committee. We were permitted in oral sessions one question and one supplementary. So and that, if we could uh, and, prove that by leadership. Uh, in our last so session, you know, there, I, I you think he's took up the first hour of it. You know? I know. I think we we just went there and we had twenty six questions in that last session. So, uh, if members are happy, it's fine. But we can extend the time so that we we give an hour and a half for a briefing rather One than one question leads into another. No, and the problem, chairman, we can't. We cannot curtail the questions. If we're supposed to be here to scrutinise what yeah. we're doing, yeah. we can't actually agree that we're going to ask one question or two questions each. Because the questions do lead in. I mean, you may have said there was 20. I mean, you cut me short last week. I counted the day. Pat had asked about 11 questions. Now, I know I should Pat asked. You could ask 21 questions. But I think if we actually want to get to the bottom of some of the things we want to know about, then we can't curtail yeah. the number of questions that a member asks. Scrutinising her. Yeah. Trevor? Um, this is not critical of anybody, but I think, I think today was a particularly unique sort of mm. session. Yeah. I, I and, wish it uh, was. <laughs> You couldn't, you couldn't really curtail oh. any of the speakers from, from maybe a bit, a bit longer than what we might have expected. That they're absolutely entitled to do that. I think we could exercise a bit more discipline. I mean, that's supposed to be question and answer. And, uh, and on a different occasion and a different subject, it probably wouldn't be necessary for so many personal anecdotes and experiences. And that, I don't mean that in a critical way. This has to come out. But... Um, Maybe, maybe we wouldn't need to extend the time if we just showed a wee bit of personal discipline. Look, I'm entirely in your hands. I, I, I have no objections either way. I have a no rush to anywhere and could stay to six or seven o'clock in the evening. I'm just thinking where we're leaving people outside the door for 45 yeah. minutes. It's, you know, we, we'll get our, we don't want us to get a bad name as being the committee that leaves people out in the corridor. And we could stretch, you know, we could add another 15 minutes on. I know like on the 18th of March, we've three presentations. We've the legal opinion the strategic investment re regeneration and then the victors, victims and survivors. At this moment, we would probably be slotting them in for an hour, an hour and an hour. We could end up with the third one there being an Something hour, an hour and a half, half late. And I'm just, I don't want to do it. I'm more than happy to put an hour and 15 minutes in. If yeah. Sure, you could and you're predicted that uh, the, the first presentation was going to well, go over. It was, but we... we well, that, 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 that was it. it. Uh, everybody had questions that they wanted to ask in their own way, and so and you said yourself rightly, it could have went on for an hour. Or okay, yeah, and, and that's fine. It, and, and there's no there's no issue. It's just if I'm getting a flavour that people are happy with where we sort of are at this stage, maybe what we'll do is just add 15 minutes on to the time so that the yeah. people and then we can be if we're playing quick catch up then and get through it faster. That 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 would be all all the, the better. Um, the second item for Chairman's Business is just to acknowledge, Fran, that you're leaving us <laughs> after that. Um, 
Which committee are you off to? Please. The community, okay. I don't, I don't know how long it goes. <laughs> but, um, a brave length, I can tell you. Oh, is that, are you on it as <laughs> well? He's me. Oh, really? Okay. Well, look, we wish you well in that, Fran. Thank you for your contributions in the committee um, so far. Um, any other business? Is there any other items for other be. business? Then, uh, folks, the date and time of the next meeting is in two weeks' time. Uh, next week, week is week. off. It's the 18th of March at 2 o'clock here in room 30. OK, thank you very much indeed. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.